introduction of mr punch's model music hall songs and dramas by f anstey this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to find out how you can volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by don w jenkins introduction the day is approaching and may even now be within measurable distance when the music halls of the metropolis will find themselves under yet more stringent supervision than is already exercised by those active and intelligent guardians of middle-class morality the london county council the moral microscope which detected latent indecency in the pursuit of a butterfly by a marionette is to be provided with larger powers and a still more extended field in other words our far-sighted and vigilant county councilmen perceiving the futility of delaying the inspection of variety entertainments until such improprieties as are contained therein have been suffered to contaminate the public mind for a considerable period are determined to nip these poison flowers in the bud for the future and unless mr punch is misinformed will apply to parliament at the earliest opportunity for clauses enabling them to require each item in every forthcoming performance to be previously submitted to a special committee for sanction and approval the conscientious rigour with which they will discharge this new and congenial duty may perhaps be better understood after perusing the little prophetic sketch which follows for mr punch's poet when not employed in metrical composition is a seer of some pretensions in a small way and several of his predictions have already been shamelessly plagiarized by the unscrupulous hand of destiny it is not improbable that this latest effort of his will receive a similar compliment although this would be more gratifying if destiny ever condescended to acknowledge such obligations however here is the forecast for what it is worth a sum of incalculable amount poetic licenses a vision of the near future scene a committee room of the london county council subcommittee of censors appointed under new regulations to report on all songs intended to be sung on the music hall stage discovered in session mr wheedler retained for the ballad writers the next license i have to apply for is for well with some hesitation a composition which certainly borders on the er amorous but i think sir you will allow that it is treated in a purely pastoral and arcadian spirit the chairman gravely there are arcades mr wheedler i may remind you which are by no means pastoral i cannot too often repeat that we are here to fulfil the mission entrusted to us by the democracy which will no longer tolerate in its entertainments anything that is either vulgar silly or offensive in the slightest degree applause mr wheedler quite so with your permission sir i will read you the ballad reads molly and i oh the day shall be marked in red letter the chairman one moment mr wheedler conferring with his colleagues marked with red letter isn't that a little uh, liable to you don't think they'll have read hawthorne's book very well then go on mr wheedler please mr wheedler twas warm with a heaven so blue first censor can't pass those two epithets you must tone them down mr wheedler much too suggestive mr wheedler that shall be done the chairman and it ought to be sky mr wheedler when amid the lush meadows i met her my molly so modest and true second censor i object to the word lush a direct incitement to intemperance mr wheedler i'll strike it out reads around us the little kids rollicked light-hearted were all the young lambs second censor surely kids is rather a vulgar expression mr wheedler 
Make it children, and I've no objection. Mr. Wheedler. I have made it so. Reads. They kicked up their legs as they frolicked. Third censor. If that is intended to be done on the stage, I protest. Most strongly, a high, indecorous exhibition. Murmurs of approval. Mr. Wheedler. But they're only lambs. Third censor. Lambs, indeed. We are determined to put down all kicking in music hall songs, no matter who does it. Strike that line out. Mr. Wheedler, reading. And frisked by the side of their dams. First censor, severely. No profanity, Mr. Wheedler, if you please. Mr. Wheedler. Er, I'll read you the refrain. Reads, limply. Molly and I, with nobody nigh, Hearts all a-throb with a rapturous bliss, Molly was shy, and at first so was I, Till I summoned up courage to ask for a kiss. The Chairman. Nobody nigh, Mr. Wheedler. I don't quite like that. The music hall ought to set a good example to young persons. Molly and I, with her chaperone by, is better. Second Censor. And that last line, asking for a kiss, does the song state that they were formally engaged, Mr. Wheedler? Mr. Wheedler. I, I believe it omits to mention the fact. But, ingeniously, it does not appear that the request was complied with. Second Censor. No matter, it should never have been made. Have the goodness to alter that into, well, something of this kind. And I always addressed her politely as Miss. Then we may pass it. Mr. Wheedler, reading the next verse. She wore but a simple sunbonnet. First censor, shocked. Now, really, Mr. Wheedler, really, sir. Mr. Wheedler. Or Molly goes plainly attired. First censor, indignantly. I should think so. Scandalous. Mr. Wheedler. Malediction I muttered upon it, one glimpse of her face I desired. The Chairman. I think my colleague's exception is perhaps just a little far-fetched. At all events, if we substitute for the last couplet, her dress is sufficient, though on it she only spends what is strictly required. Eh, Mr. Wheedler? Then we work in a moral as well, you see, and avoid malediction, which can only mean bad language. Mr. Wheedler, doubtfully. With all respect, I submit that it doesn't scan quite so well. The Chairman, sharply. I venture to think scansion may be sacrificed to propriety occasionally, Mr. Wheedler, but pray go on. Mr. Wheedler, continuing. To a streamlet we rambled together. I carried her tenderly o'er in my arms. She's as light as a feather, that sweetest of burdens I bore. First Censor i really must protest no properly conducted young woman would ever have permitted such a thing you must alter that mr wheedler second censor then i don't know but i rather fancy there's a double intender in that word light to colleague it strikes me eh what do you think the chairman in a conciliatory manner i am inclined to agree to some extent not that i consider the words particularly objectionable in themselves but we are men of the world mr wheedler and as such we cannot shut our eyes to the fact that a music-hall audience is only too apt to find significance in many apparently innocent expressions and phrases mr wheedler but sir i understand from your remarks recently that the democracy were strongly opposed to anything in the nature of suggestiveness the chairman exactly so and therefore we cannot allow their susceptibilities to be shocked with a severe jocosity molly and you mr wheedler must either ford the stream like ordinary persons or stay where you are mr wheedler depressed i may as well read the last verse i suppose then under the flickering willow i lay by the rivulet's brink with her lap for a sumptuous pillow first censor we can't have that it is really not respectable the chairman pleasantly can't we alter it slightly i'd brought a small portable pillow no objection to that 
the other censors expressed dissent in undertones mr wheedler till i owned that i longed for a drink third censor no no a drink we all know what that means alcoholic stimulant of some kind at all events that's how the audience are certain to take it mr wheedler feebly so molly her pretty hands hollowed into curves like an exquisite cup and draughts so delicious i swallowed that rivulet nearly dried up third censor well mr wheedler you're not going to defend that i hope mr wheedler i'm not prepared to deny that it is silly very silly but hardly uh, vulgar i should have thought third censor that is a question of taste which we won't dispute i call it distinctly vulgar why can't the drink be out of his own hands the chairman blandly allow me how would this do for the second line she had a collapsible cup a good many people do carry them i have one myself is that all of your ballad mr wheedler mr wheedler with great relief that is all sir censors withdraw to consider the question the chairman after consultation with colleagues we have carefully considered this song and we are all reluctantly of opinion that we cannot consistently with our duty recommend the council to license it even with the alterations my colleagues and myself have gone somewhat out of our way to suggest the whole subject is too dangerous for a hall in which young persons of both sexes are likely to be found assembled and the absence of any distinct assertion that the young couple molly and uh the gentleman who narrates the experience are betrothed or that their attachment is in any way sanctioned by their parents or guardians is quite fatal if we have another ballad of a similar character from the same quarter mr wheedler i feel bound to warn you that we may possibly consider it necessary to advise that the poet's license should be cancelled altogether mr wheedler i will take care to mention it to my client sir i understand it is his intention to confine himself to writing gaiety burlesques in future the chairman a laudable resolution i hope he will keep it scene closes in it is hardly possible that any music hall manager or vocalist irreproachable as he may hitherto have considered himself can have taken this glimpse into a not very remote futurity without symptoms of uneasiness if not of positive dismay he will reflect that the ballad of molly and i however reprehensible it may appear in the fierce light of an l c c committee room is innocuous and even moral compared to the ditties in his own repertoire how then can he hope when his hour of trial strikes to confront the ordeal with an unruffled shirt front or a collar that shall retain the inflexibility of conscious innocence and he will wish then that he had confined himself to the effusions of a bard who could not be blamed by the most censorious moralist here if he will only accept the warning in time is his best safeguard he has only to buy this little volume and inform his inquisitors that the songs and business with which he proposes to entertain an ingenuous public are derived from the immaculate pages of mr punch whereupon censure will be instantly disarmed and criticism give place to congratulation it is just possible to be sure that this somewhat confident prediction smacks rather of the poet than the seer and that even the entertainment supplied by mr punch's music hall may to the purest's eye present features as suggestive as a horrid vulgar clown or as shocking as a butterfly an insect notorious for its frivolity but then so might the songs and business of the performing canary or the innocent sprightliness of the educated flea with its superfluity of legs all absolutely unclad at all events the compiler of this collection ventures to hope that whether it is fortunate enough to find favour or not with music-hall artistes literary critics and london county councilmen it contains nothing particularly objectionable to the rest of the british public and very likely even in this modest aspiration he is over sanguine and his little joke will be taken seriously earnestness is so alarmingly on the increase in these days 
End of Introduction Read by Don W. Jenkins, Rancho San Diego, California, shaggybark.blogspot.com Of Mr. Punch's Model Music Hall Songs by F. Anstey This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins Chapter One The Patriotic this stirring ditty, so thoroughly sound and practical under all its sentiment, has been specially designed to harmonize with the recently altered tone of music-hall audiences, in which a spirit of enlightened radicalism is at last happily discernible. It is hoped that, both in rhyme and meter, the verses will satisfy the requirements of this most elegant form of composition. The song is intended to be shouted through music in the usual manner by a singer in evening dress, who should carry a small union jack carelessly thrust inside his waistcoat. The title is short, but taking. On the Cheap First Verse Of a navy insufficient cowards croak, dear boys, if our place among the nations were to keep but with british beef and beer and hearts of oak dear boys with enthusiasm we can make a shift to do it on the cheap chorus with a common sense air let us keep dear boys on the cheap while britannia is the boss upon the deep she can wallop an invader when he comes in his armada if she's let alone to do it on the cheap second verse affectionately johnny bull is just as plucky as he was dear boys with a knowing wink and he's wide awake no error not asleep but he won't stump up for ironclads because dear boys he don't see his way to get em on the cheap chorus so keep dear boys on the cheap gallantly and we'll chance what may happen on the deep for we can't be the losers if we save the cost of cruisers and contentedly continue on the cheap third verse the british isles are not the continent dear boys scornfully where the johnnies on defence spend a heap no we're britons and we're game to jog along dear boys with pathos in the old time honoured fashion on the cheap chorus i'll keep dear boys on the cheap for the price we're asked to pay is pretty steep let us all unite to dock it keep the money in our pocket and we'll conquer or we'll perish on the cheap fourth verse if the tories have the cheek to touch our purse dear boys their reward at the elections let them reap they will find a big conservative reverse dear boys if they can't defend the country on the cheap chorus they must keep dear boys on the cheap or the lot out of office we will sweep bull gets rusty when you tax him and his patriotic maxim is i'll trouble you to govern on the cheap fifth verse this to be sung shrewdly if the government ain't mugs they'll take the tip dear boys just to look a bit ahead before they leap and instead of laying down an extra ship dear boys they'll cut down the whole caboodle on the cheap chorus with spirit and fervour and keep dear boys on the cheap for we ain't like a bloomin lot of sheep when we want to parry bellum union jack to be waved here you may bet your boots will tell em but we'll have the bellum parried on the cheap this song if sung with any spirit should mr punch thinks cause a positive furor in any truly patriotic gathering 
and possibly go some way towards influencing the decision of the country and consequently the fate of the empire in the next general elections in the meantime it is at the service of any champion music hall comique who is capable of appreciating it end of chapter one sung and read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com two of mr punch's model music hall by f anstey this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by don w jenkins chapter two the topical political in most respects no doubt the present example can boast no superiority to ditties in the same style now commanding the ear of the public one merit however its author does claim for it though it deals with most of the burning questions of the hour it can be sung anywhere with absolute security this is due to a simple but ingenious method by which the political sentiment has been arranged on the reversible principle a little alteration here and there will put the singer in close touch with an audience of almost any shade of politics should it happen that the title has been already anticipated mr punch begs to explain that the remainder of this sparkling composition is entirely original any similarity with previous works must be put down entirely to literary coincidence whether the title is new or not it is a very nice one that is between you and me and the post to be sung in a raucous voice and with a confidential air i've dropped in to whisper some secrets i've heard between you and me and the post picked up on the wing by a cute little bird we are gentlemen here so the caution's absurd still you please to remember that every word is between you and me and the post chorus to which the singer should dance between you and me and the post an int is sufficient at most i'd very much rather this didn't go farther than tween you and me and the post at lord sorlsbury's table there's such a to-do between you and me and the post when he first catches sight of his dinner menu and sees he's set down to good old irish stew which he's sick of by this time now tell me ain't you between you and me and the post this happy and pointed allusion to the irish question is sure to provoke loud laughter from an audience of radical sympathies for unionists the words lord Searlesbury's can be altered by our patent reversible method into the g o m s without at all impairing the satire chorus as before the g o m s hiding a card up his sleeve between you and me and the post any ground he has lost he is going to retrieve and what his little game is he'll let us perceive and he'll pip the whole lot of em so i believe between you and me and the post chorus the hit will be made quite as palpably for the other side by substituting lord sorlsbury's etc at the beginning of the first line should the majority of the audience be found to hold conservative views little randolph won't long be left out in the cold between you and me and the post if they let him inside the conservative fold he has promised no longer he'll swagger and scold but to be a good boy and to do as he's told between you and me and the post chorus the mere mention of lord randolph's name is sufficient to ensure the success of any song joey chamberlain's orchid's a bit overblown between you and me and the post this is rather subtle perhaps but an m h audience will see a joke in it somewhere and laugh how to swear a round table i'm sure he has shown same observation applies here but of late he's been leaving his old friends alone and i fancy he's grinding an axe of his own between you and me and the post chorus we now pass on to topics of the day which we treat in a light but trenchant fashion on the new county councils they've too many knobs between you and me and the post 
for the swells stick together and sneer at the mobs and it's always the rich man the poor one who robs we shall add the old business all jabber and jobs between you and me and the post chorus and b this verse should not be read to the london county council who might miss the fun of it there's a new rule for ladies presented at court between you and me and the post my necks are allowed so no colds will be court but i went to the drawing-room lately and thought some old women had dressed quite as low as they ought between you and me and the post chorus by fussy alarmists we're too much annoyed between you and me and the post if we don't want our neighbors to think we're a freud m h rhyme spending dibs on defence we had better avoid and give em instead to the poor unemployed m h political economy between you and me and the post chorus this style of political singing ain't hard between you and me and the post as a mammoth comic on the bills i am starred and so long as i'm called and angered and a roared i can rattle off rubbish like this by the yard between you and me and the post chorus and dance off to sing the same song with or without alterations in another place end of chapter two read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com of mr punch's model music hall by f anstey this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by don w jenkins chapter three a democratic ditty the following example although it gives a not wholly inadequate expression to what are understood to be the loftier aspirations of the most advanced and earnest section of the new democracy should not be attempted as yet before a west end audience in south or east london the sentiment and philosophy of the song may possibly excite rapturous enthusiasm in the west end though the tone is daily improving they are not educated quite up to so exalted a level at present still as an experiment in proselytism it might be worth risking even there the title it bears is given away with a pound of tea verse one introductory some grocers have taken to keeping a stock of ornaments such as a vase or a clock with a ticket on each where the words you may see to be given away with a pound of tea chorus in waltz time given away that's what they say gratis a present it's offered you free given away with nothing to pay given away with a pound of tea verse two containing the moral reflection now the sight of those tickets gave me an idea what it set me a thinkin you're goin to ear i thought there were things that would possibly be better given away with a pound of tea chorus given away so much as to say etc verse three this as being rather personal and general in its application may need some apology it is really put in as a graceful concession to the taste of an average music hall audience who like to be assured that the artists who amuse them are as unfortunate as they are erratic in their domestic relations now there's my old missus who sits up at home and when i sneak upstairs my air she will comb i don't think i'd call it bad business if she could be given away with a pound of tea chorus given away that's what they say etc mutatis mutandis verse four flying at higher game the social satire here is perhaps almost too good-natured seeing what intolerable pests all peers are to the truly democratic mind but we must walk before we can run good-humoured contempt will do very well for the present fair americans slap up the pick of our lords it's a practice a sensible britain applauds this will check any groaning at the mention of aristocrats far from grudging our dukes to the pretty yankee magnanimously why we'd give em away with a pound of tea chorus give em away so we all say etc 
Verse 5. More frankly democratic still. Towards a republic we're getting on fast. Many old institutions are things of the past. Philosophically. Soon the crown will go to as an anomaly and be given away with a pound of tea. Chorus. Given away. Some future day. Etc. Verse 6. Which expresses the peaceful proclivities of the populace with equal eloquence and wisdom. A welcome contrast to the era when Britons had a bellicose and immoral belief in the possibility of being called upon to defend themselves at some time we've made up our minds though the jingles may jor under no provocation to drift into war so the best thing to do with our costly navy is give each ship away with a pound of tea chorus give em away etc verse seven we cannot well avoid some reference to the irish question in a music hall ditty but observe the logical and statesmanlike method of treating it here the argument if crudely stated is borrowed from some advanced by our foremost politicians we've also discovered at last that it's cruel to deny the poor irish the right to home rule so to give em a parliament let us agree rationally or they might blow us up with a pound of their tea a euphemism which may possibly be remembered and understood chorus give it away etc verse eight culminating in a glorious prophetic burst of the coming dawn iniquitous burdens and rates will relax for each h that's pronounced we will clap on a tax a very popular measure and a house in belgravia with furniture free shall each socialist sit in a taking his tea chorus and dance off given away gratis will get it for nothing and free given away not a penny to pay given away with a pound of tea if this democratic dream does not appeal favorably to the imagination of the humblest citizen the popular tone must have been misrepresented by many who claim to act as its chosen interpreters a supposition mr punch must decline to entertain for a single moment End of chapter 3, read by Don W. Jenkins, Rancho San Diego, California, shaggybark.blogspot.com. Of Mr. Punch's Model Music Hall by F. Anstey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter 4 The Idyllic. The following ballad will not be found above the heads of an average audience, while it is constructed to suit the capacities of almost any lady artiste. So shy. The singer should, if possible, be of mature age and inclined to a comfortable embonpoint. As soon as the bell has given the signal for the orchestra to attack the prelude, she will step upon the stage with that air of being hung on wires which seems to come from a consciousness of being a favourite of the public i'm a dainty little daisy of the dingle self-praise is a great recommendation in music-hall songs so retiring and so timid and so coy if you ask me why so long i have lived single i will tell you tis because i am so shy note the manner in which the rhyme is adapted to meet arcadian peculiarities of pronunciation spoken yes i am really though you wouldn't think it to look at me would you but for all that chorus when i'm spoken to i wriggle going off into a giggle and as red as any peony i blush then turn paler than a lily for i'm such a little silly that i'm always in a flutter or a flush after each chorus an elaborate step dance expressive of shrinking maidenly modesty i've a cottage far away from other houses which the neighbors hardly ever come annoy when they do i run and hide among the roses for i cannot cure myself of being shy spoken a great girl like me too but there it's no use trying for chorus 
when i'm spoken to i wriggle going off into a giggle and as red as any peony i blush then turn paler than a lily for i'm such a little silly that i'm always in a flutter or a flush well the other day i felt my face was crimson though i stood and fixed my gaze upon the sky for at the gate was circe charlie simpson and the sight of him's enough to turn me shy spoken it's singular but charlie always has that effect on me chorus when he speaks to me i wriggle going off into a giggle and as red as any peony i blush then turn paler than a lily for i'm such a little silly that i'm always in a flutter or a flush then said surely my pursuit there's no eviding now i've caught you i insist on a reply do you love me tell me truly little miding but how is a girl to answer when she's shy spoken for even if the conversation happens to be about nothing particular it's just the same to me chorus when i'm spoken to i wriggle going off into a giggle and as red as any peony i blush then turn paler than a lily for i'm such a little silly that i'm always in a flutter or a flush there we stood among the lilac and syringas more sweet than any s bouquet you boy arcadian for by and charlie kept on squeezing of my fingers and i couldn't tell him not to being shy spoken for as i told you before chorus when i'm spoken to i wriggle going off into a giggle and as red as any peony i blush then turn paler than a lily for i'm such a little silly that i'm always in a flutter or a flush soon my slender waist he ventured on embracing while i only heaved a gentle little soy though a scream i would have liked to raise my vice in it's so difficult to scream when you are shy spoken people have such different ways of listening to proposals as for me when they talk of love i wriggle going off into a giggle and as red as any peony i blush then turn paler than a lily for i'm such a little silly that i'm always in a flutter or a flush so very soon to church we shall be going while the bells ring out a merry peal of joy if obedience you do not hear me vowing it will only be because i am so shy we have brought the rhyme off legitimately at last it will be observed spoken yes and when i'm passing down the oil on charlie's arm with everybody looking at me i am certain i shall wriggle and go off into a giggle and as red as any peony i'll blush going through the marriage service will be sure to make me nervous note the freedom of the rhyme and to put me in a flutter and a flush End of section four read by Don W. Jenkins, Rancho San Diego, California, Shaggybark.blogspot.com Five of Mr. Punch's Model Music Hall by F. Anstey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter five The Amatory Episodic the history of a singer's latest love whether fortunate or otherwise will always command the interest and attention of a music-hall audience our example which is founded upon the very best precedents derives an additional piquancy from the social position of the beloved object cultivated readers are requested not to shudder at the rhymes mr punch's poet does them deliberately and in cold blood 
being convinced that without these somewhat daring concords no ditty would have the slightest chance of satisfying the great ear of the music-hall public the title of the song is mashed by a marchioness the singer should come on correctly and tastefully attired in a suit of loud dittos a startling tie and a white hat the orthodox costume on the music-hall stage of a middle-class swain suffering from love-sickness the air should be of the conventional jog-trot and jingle order chastened by a sentimental melancholy i've lately gone and lost my art and where you'll never guess i'm regularly mashed upon a lovely marchioness twas at a fancy fair we met inside the albert all so affable she smiled at me as i came near her stall chorus don't tell me belgravia is stiff in behavior she'd an uncle an earl and a duke for her pa still there was no starchiness in that fair marchioness as she stood at her stall in the fancy bazaar at titles and distinctions once i ignorantly scoff as if no bond could be betwixt the tradesman and the toff i held with those who do away with difference in ranks but that was all before i met the marchioness of manx don't tell me belgravia is stiff in behavior she'd an uncle an earl and a duck for her pa still there was no starchiness in that fair marchioness as she as she stood at her stall in the fancy bazaar a home was being started by some kind aristocrats for orphan kittens born of poor but well-connected cats and of the swells who planned to fate this object to assist the marchioness of manx's name stood foremost on the list don't tell me belgravia is stiff in behavior she'd an uncle an earl and a duck for her pa still there was no starchiness in that fair marchioness as she stood at her hall in the fancy bazaar i never saw a smarter hand at serving in a shop for every likely customer she caught upon the op and from the form her ladyship displayed at that bazaar with enthusiasm you might have took your oath she'd been brought up behind a bar don't tell me belgravia is stiff in behavior she'd an uncle an earl and a duck for her pa still there was no starchiness in that fair marchioness as she stood at her stall in the fancy bazaar in vain i tried to kid her that my purse had been forgot she spotted me in half a jiff and chaffed me precious hot a sovereign for one regular she gammoned me to spend you really can't refuse she said i've bitten off the end don't tell me belgravia is stiff in behavior she'd an uncle and an earl and a duck for her pa still there was no starchiness in that fair marchioness as she stood at her stall in the fancy bazaar do by my cruel work she urged it goes across a chair you'll find it coming useful as you see you isle your air so i handed over thirty bob though not a coiny bloke i couldn't tell a marchioness how nearly i was broke spoken though i did take the liberty of saying make it fifteen bob my lady but she said with such a fascinating look i can see it yet oh i'm sure you're not a agglin kind of a man she says you haven't the face for it and think of all them poor fatherless kittings she says think what thirty bob means to them says she glancing up so pitiful and tender under her long eyelashes at me all oh, the radicals may ask as they like but don't tell me belgravia is stiff in behavior she'd an uncle an earl and a duck for her pa 
still there was no starchiness in that fair marchioness as she stood at her stall in the fancy bazaar a raffle was the next concern i put my rhino in the prize a talking parrot which i didn't want to win then her sister lady tabby showed a painted milking stool and i bought it though it's not a thing i sit on as a rule spoken not but what it was a handsome article in its way too had a snow scene with a sunset done in oil on it it will look lovely in your chambers says the marchioness it was ever so much admired at catterwall castle it didn't look so bad in my three pair back i must say though unfortunately the sunset came off on me the very first time i happened to set down on it still think of the condescension of painting such a thing at all don't tell me belgravia is stiff in behaviour she'd an uncle an earl and a duck for her pa still there was no starchiness in that fair marchioness as she stood at her stall in the fancy bazaar the marquis kept a fidgeting and frowning at his wife for she talked to me as free as if she'd known me all her life i felt that i was in the swim so wasn't over awed but hung about and spend my cash as lavish as a lord spoken it was worth all the money i can tell you to be chatting there across the counter with a real live marchioness for as long as ever my funds would hold out they'd have held out much longer only the marchioness made it a rule never to give change she couldn't break it she said not even for me i wish i could give you an idea of how she smiled as she made that remark for the fact is when an aristocrat does unbend well don't tell me belgravia is stiff in behaviour she'd an uncle an earl and a duck for her pa still there was no starchiness in that fair marchioness as she stood at her stall in the fancy bazaar next time i meet the marchioness a riding in the row i'll catch her eye and raise my hat and up to her i'll go with sentiment and tell her next my heart i keep the stump of that cigar she sold me on the happy day we had at her bazaar spoken and she'll be pleased to see me again oh, i know she's not one of your stuck-up sort don't you make no mistake about it the aristocracy ain't half as bloated as people imagine who don't know em whenever i hear parties is running em down i always say don't tell me belgravia is stiff in behaviour she'd an uncle an earl and a duke for her pa still there was no starchiness in that fair marchioness as she stood at her stall in the fancy bazaar end of section five read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com of the model music hall by f anstey this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by don w jenkins chapter six the chivalrous the singer who should be a large man in evening dress with a crumpled shirt front will come on stage with a bearing intended to convey at first sight that he is a devoted admirer of the fair sex after removing his crush hat in an easy manner and winking airily at the orchestra he will begin why shouldn't the darlings there's enthusiasm brimming in the breasts of all the women and they're calling for enfranchisement with clamour eloquent when some parties in a huff rage at the plea for female suffrage i invariably floor them with a simple argument chorus to be rendered with a winning persuasiveness why shouldn't the darlings have votes dear things on politics each of em dotes dear things pathetically oh it does seem so hard they should all be debarred cause they happen to wear petticoats dear things 
nature all the hens to crow meant i could prove it in a moment though they've selfishly been silenced by the cock-a-doodle-doos but no man of sense afraid is of enfranchising the ladies magnanimously let em put their pretty fingers into any pie they choose spoken for chorus why shouldn't the darlings have votes dear things on politics each of em dotes dear things pathetically oh it does seem so hard they should all be debarred cause they happen to wear petticoats dear things they would cease to care for dresses if we made them electresses no more time they'd spend on needlework nor at pianos strum every dainty little dorcas would be sitting on a caucus busy wire pulling to produce the new millennium spoken oh chorus why shouldn't the darlings have votes dear things on politics each of em dotes dear things oh it does seem so hard they should all be debarred cause they happen to wear petticoats dear things in the house we'll see them sitting soon it will be only fitting they should have an opportunity their country's laws to frame and the ladies legislation will be sure to cause sensation for they'll do away with everything that seems to them a shame then why shouldn't the darlings have votes dear things on politics each of em dotes dear things oh it does seem so hard they should all be debarred cause they happen to wear petticoats dear things they will promptly clap a stopper on whate'er they deem improper put an end to vaccination landed property and pubs and they'll find tom dick and harry if they don't look sharp and merry for the kindergartens confiscate those nasty horrid clubs ah why shouldn't the darlings have votes dear things on politics each of em dotes dear things oh it does seem so hard they should all be devoured cause they happen to wear petticoats dear things they'll declare it's quite immoral to engage in foreign quarrel and that britons never never will be warriors any more when our forces are abolished and defences all demolished they will turn upon the jingo tack and want to go to war so why shouldn't the darlings have votes dear things on politics each of em dotes dear things oh it does seem so hard they should all be debarred cause they happen to wear petticoats dear things with a grieved air yet there's some who'd close such vistas to their poor downtrodden sisters and persuade em if they're offered votes politely to refuse say they do not care about em and would rather be without em oh i haven't common patience with such narrow-minded views no why shouldn't the darlings have votes dear things on politics each of them dotes dear things oh it does seem so hard they should all be debarred cause they happen to wear petticoats dear things and it's females that's the puzzle who petition for the muzzle which i call it poor and paltry and i think they'll say so too they are not in any danger let em drop the dog in manger if they don't require the vote themselves there's other ladies do and why shouldn't the darlings have votes dear things on politics each of em dotes dear things oh it does seem so hard they should all be debarred cause they happen to wear petticoats dear things here the singer will gradually retreat backwards to the rear of the stage open his crush hat 
and extend it in an attitude of triumph as the curtain descends end of section six read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com model music hall by f anstey this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by don w jenkins chapter seven the frankly canal any ditty which accurately reflects the habits and amusements of the people is a valuable human document a fact that probably accounts for the welcome which songs in the following style invariably receive from music hall audiences generally if mr punch presumes they conceived such pictures of their manner of spending a holiday to be unjustly or incorrectly drawn in any way they would protest strongly against being so grossly misrepresented as they do nothing of the sort no apology can be needed for the following effusion which several ladies now adorning the music hall stage could be trusted to render with immense effect the singer should be young and charming and attired as simply as possible simplicity of attire imparts additional piquancy to the words the poor old horse we had a little outing last sunday afternoon and such a jolly lark it was i shan't forget it soon we borrowed an excursion van to take us down to kew and oh we did enjoy ourselves i don't mind telling you this to the chef d'orchestra who will assume a polite interest here a little spoken interlude is customary mr p does not venture to do more than indicate this by a synopsis the details can be filled in according to the taste and fancy of the fair artiste yes we did have a time i can assure yer the party me and jimmy opkins old pa plapper asked because he lent me the van the meanness of his subsequent conduct aunt snapper her imposing appearance in her coffee-coloured front bill blazer his girl and his accordion mrs addick of the fried fish emporium round the corner her gentility never seen out of her mittens and always the lady no matter how much she may have taken from this work round by an easy transition to the chorus for we had to stop a course just to bait the bloomin oars so we'd pots of ale and porter or a drop o something shorter while he drunk his pail o water he was such a whale on water that more water than he oughter more water than he oughter add the poor old horse second stanza that horse he was a rum un, a queer old quadruped at every public house he passed he'd cock his artful head says i if he goes on like this we shan't see q to-night jim hopkins winks his eye and says we'll get along all right though we have to stop of course just to bait the bloomin horse so we'd pots of ale and porter or a drop o something shorter while he drunk his pail of water he was such a whale on water that more water than he oughter more water than he oughter add the poor old horse third stanza at kinsington we all to dammer smith and turn em green the horse had such a thirst on him its like was never seen with every arf a mile or so that animal got blown and we was far too well brought up to let him drink alone as we had to stop a course just to bait the bloomin horse so we'd pots of ale and porter or a drop of something shorter while he drunk his pail o water he was such a whale on water that more water than he oughter more water than he oughter add the poor old oars fourth stanza we stopped again at chiswick till at last we got to kew but when we reached the gardings well there was a fine to do the keeper in his gold lace tile was shutting to the gate says he there's no admittance now you're just arrived too late 
synopsis of spoken interlude spirited passage at arms between mr william blazer and the keeper singular action of pa plapper i want to see your pagoder bring out your old pagoder as you're so proud on mrs addick's disappointment at not being able to see the intemperant plants and the pitcher shrub once more her subsidence into tears on the floor of the van keeper concludes the dialogue by inquiring why the party did not arrive sooner and we says well it was like this old cock robin do yer see we had to stop of course just to bait the bloomin oars so we'd pots of ale and porter or a drop of something shorter while he drunk his pail of water he was such a whale on water that more water than he oughter more water than he oughter had the poor old horse fifth stanza don't fret i says about it for they ain't got much to see inside their precious guardings so let's go and have some tea a cup i seem to fancy now i feel that faint and limp with a slice of bread and butter and some creases and a shrimp description of the tea and the shrimps well i don't want to say anything against the shrimps but it did strike me that they were feeling the eat a little shrimps are liable to it and you couldn't prevent em after tea the only tune mr blazer could play on his accordion tragic end of that instrument how that party had a little more lush scandalous behavior of bill blazer's girl the company consume what will be elegantly referred to as a bit of booze aunt snapper gets the ump the outrage to her front the proposal to start whereupon mrs addick who was a settin on the geraniums in the winder smilin at her boots which she just took off because they said they stopped her breathing protested that there was no hurry considering that we've got to stop of course just to bait the bloomin oars so we've pots of ale and parter or a drop of something shorter while he drunk his pail of water he was such a whale on water that more water than he oughter more water than he oughter had the poor old horse sixth stanza but when the van was ordered we found what do yer think to the chef d'orchestra who will affect complete ignorance that miserable horse had been and took too much to drink he kept a reeling around us like a circus work by steam and instead o keepin singular he'd turned into a team disgust of the party pa plapper proposes to go back to the inn for more refreshment urging we must wait a while o course till they've sobered down the oars just another pot of porter or a drop of something shorter while our good landlady's daughter takes him out some sort of water for he's had more than he oughter he's had more than he oughter as the poor old horse seventh stanza so when they brought the horse around we started on our way twas awful how the animal from side to side would sway young hopkins took the reins but soon in slumber he was sunk indignantly when a interfering copper ran us in for being drunk attitude of various members of the party unwarrantable proceeding on the part of the constable remonstrance by pa plapper and the company generally in why can't you she o course tis and us it is the orsh he's a whale at swilling water we've had only ale and porter or a drop of something shorter you let me go you snorter don't you touch me till you order just look here to cut it shorter take the poor old orsh general adjournment to the police station interview with the magistrate on the following morning mr hopkins called upon to state his defence replies in why your worship sees of course it was all the bloomin horse he would have a pail of water every arf a mile or quarter which is what he didn't order he shall stick to ale or porter with a drop of something shorter i'm my family's supporter find the poor old horse 
the magistrate's view of the case concluding remark that notwithstanding the success of the excursion as a whole it will be some time before the singer consents to go upon any excursion with a horse of such bibulous tendencies as those of the quadruped they drove to q end of section seven read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com Of Mr. Punch's Model Music Hall by F. Anstey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter Eight: The Dramatic Scena. This is always a popular form of entertainment, demanding as it does even more dramatic than vocal ability on the part of the artist. A song of this kind is nothing if not severely moral and frequently depicts the downward career of an incipient drunkard with all the lurid logic of a temperance tract mr punch however is inclined to think that the lesson would be even more appreciated and taken to heart by the audience if a slightly different line were adopted such as he has endeavoured to indicate in the following example the danger of mixed drinks the singer should have a great command of facial expression which he will find greatly facilitated by employing as indeed is the usual custom colored limelight at the wings first verse to be sung under pure white light he these awful examples are usually and quite properly anonymous was once as nice a fellow as you could desire to meet partial to a pint of porter always took his spirits neat long ago a careful mother's cautions trained her son to shrink from the meretricious sparkle of an aerated drink refrain showing the virtuous youth resisting temptation n b the refrain is intended to be spoken through music not sung here's a pub that's handy liquor up with you thimble full of brandy don't mind if i do soda water no sir never touch the stuff promised mother so sir with an upward glance tisn't good enough second verse primrose light for this ah how little we suspected as we saw him in his bloom what a demon dogged his footsteps luring to an awful doom vain his mother's fond monition soon a friend with fiendish laugh tempts him to a quiet tea garden plies him there with shandy gaff refrain illustrating the first false step why it's just the mixture i so long have sought here i'll be a fixture till i've drunk the quart just the stuff to suit her waiter do you hear make it for the future three parts ginger beer third verse requiring violet tinted slide by and by the ale discarding ginger beer he craves alone undiluted he procures it buys it bottled up in stone the earthenware bottles are said by connoisseurs to contain liquor of superior strength and quality from his lips the foam he brushes crimson overspreads his brow to his brain the gingers mounting could his mother see him now refrain depicting the horrors of a solitary debauch poisoned by remorse shall i have another only ginger pop wildly ah i promised mother not to touch a drop far too much i'm tempted recklessly let me drink my fill that's the fifth i've emptied oh i feel so ill here the singer will stagger about the boards fourth verse turn on lurid crimson ray for this next with drinks they style teetotal he his manhood must degrade swilling effervescent syrups ice cream soda raspberry aid cumis tempts his jaded palate payment he's obliged to bilk then reduced to destitution finds forgetfulness in milk refrain indicating rapid moral deterioration what's that on the railings point dramatically at imaginary area milk and in a can 
though i have my failings i'm an honest man spark of expiring rectitude here i can not resist it pantomime of opening can that celestial blue has the milkman missed it melodramatically i'll be missing too fifth verse in pale blue light milk begets a taste for water so comparatively cheap every casual pump supplies him gratis with potations deep he at every drinking fountain pounces on the pewter cup conscious of becoming bloated powerless to give it up refrain illustrative of utter loss of self-respect find one straight before me bobby you're a trump faintness stealing o'er me ha at last a pump if that little maid'll just make room for one i could grab the ladle after she has done the last verse is the culminating point of this moral drama the miserable wretch has reached the last stage he shuts himself up in his cheerless abode and there in shameful secrecy consumes the element for which he is powerless to pay the inevitable nemesis following sixth verse all lights down in front ghastly green light at wings up his sordid stairs in secret to the cistern now he steals where amidst organic matter gamble microscopic eels tremblingly he turns the tap on not a trickle greets the trough for the stony-hearted turncock's gone and cut his water off refrain in which the profligate is supposed to demand an explanation from the turncock with the terrible denouement right a quarter owing company stopped supply set the stream a-flowing demon or you die mercy oh you've choked me in hoarse strangled voice as the turncock will you turn the plug savagely as the hero no faintly as turncock business of fingering a corpse on stage and regarding it terror-stricken a long pause then in a whisper the fool provoked me with a maniac laugh horror i am a thug here the artist will die mad in frightful agony and rise to bow his acknowledgments end of section eight read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com of the model music hall by f anstey this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by don w jenkins chapter nine the duettists the duet and dance form so important a feature in music hall entertainments that they could hardly with any propriety be neglected in a model compilation such as mr punch's and it is possible that he may offer more than one example of this blameless diversion for some reason or other the habit of singing in pairs would seem to induce a pessimistic tone of mind in most music-hall artistes and why mr punch does not pretend to say this cynicism is always more marked when the performers are of the softer sex our present study is intended to fulfil the requirements of the most confirmed female sceptic and though the message of the music halls may have been given worthier and fuller expression by pens more practised in such compositions mr punch is still modestly confident that this ditty with all its shortcomings can be sung in any music hall in the metropolis without exciting any sentiment other than entire approval of the teaching it conveys one drawback indeed it has but that concerns the performers alone for the sake of affording contrast and relief it was thought expedient that one of the fair duettists should profess an optimism which may perhaps must tend to impair her popularity a conscientious artiste may legitimately object for the sake of her professional reputation to present herself in so humiliating a character as that of an ingenue and a female juggins and it does seem as if the cynical sister must inevitably monopolize the sympathies of an enlightened audience however this difficulty is less formidable than it appears it should be easy for the unsophisticated sister to convey a subtle suggestion here and there 
possibly in the incidental dance between the verses that she is not really inferior to her partner in smartness and knowledge of the world but perhaps it would be the fairest arrangement if the sisters could agree to alternate so ungrateful a role rhino first verse first sister placing three of the fingers of her left hand on her heart and extending her right arm in timid appeal dear sister of late i'm beginning to doubt if the world is as black as they paint it it mayn't be as bad as some try to make out second sister with an elaborate mock curtsy that is a discovery mayn't it first sister abashed i'm sure there are several who aren't a bad lot and some sort of principle seem to have got for they act on the square second sister don't you talk tommy rot it's done for advertisement ain't it refrain second sister why there's nobody at bottom any better than the rest first sister are you sure of it second sister i'm telling you and i know the principle they act pawns whatever pays em best and the only real religion now is rhino the last word must be rendered with full metallic effect a step dance expressive of conviction on one part and incipient wavering on the other should be performed between the verses second verse first sister returning shaken to the charge some unmarried men lead respectable lives second sister decisively well i've never happened to meet them first sister there are husbands who are always polite to their wives second sister of course if they're better haves beat them first sister some tradesmen have consciences so i've heard said their provisions are never adulterated but they treat all their customers fairly instead second sister cause they don't find an answer to cheat them refrain first sister what second sister no they're none of em at bottom any better than the rest second sister i'm speaking from experience and i know if you could put a window pane in everybody's breast you'd see on all the hearts was written rhino third verse first sister there are girls you can't tempt with a title or gold second sister there may be but i've never seen one first sister so much prefer love in a cottage i'm told second sister putting her arms akimbo if you swallow that you're a green one they'll stick to their lover so long as he's cash when it's gone they look out for a wealthier mash a girl on the gush talks on practical trash when it comes to the point she's a keen one refrain first sister then are none of us at bottom any better than the rest second sister cheerfully not a bit i'm a girl myself and i know first sister you'd surely never give your hand to someone you detest second sister why rather if he's rolling in the rhino fourth verse first sister philanthropists give up their lives to the poor second sister it's chiefly with tracts they present them first sister still some self-denial i'm sure they endure second sister it's their hobby and seems to content them first sister but don't they go into those horrible slums second sister sometimes with a flourish of trumpets and drums first sister i've heard they've collected magnificent sums second sister and nobody knows how they've spent them refrain second sister oh they're none of em at bottom any better than the rest they're only bigger hypocrites as i know they're famous opportunities for feathering their nest when so many fools are ready with the rhino fifth verse first sister our statesmen are prompted by duty alone second sister compassionately whoever's been gammoning you so first sister 
they wouldn't take office for ends of their own second sister what else would induce em to do so first sister but time health and money they all sacrifice second sister i'd do it myself at a quarter the price there's pickings for all and they needn't ask twice for they're able to put on the screw so refrain together no they're none of em at bottom any better than the rest they may kid to their constituents but i know whatever lofty sentiments their speeches may suggest they regulate their actions by the rhino here the pair will perform a final step dance indicative of enlightened scepticism and skip off in an effusion of sisterly sympathy amidst enthusiastic applause end of section nine read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com ten of the model music hall by f anstey this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by don w jenkins chapter ten disinterested passion when a music hall singer does not treat of the tender passion in a rakish and knowing spirit he is apt to exhibit an unworldliness truly ideal in its noble indifference to all social distinctions so amiable a tendency deserves encouragement and mr punch has much pleasure in offering the following little idol to the notice of any mammoth comique who may happen to be in a sentimental mood it is supposed to be sung by a scion of the nobility and the artiste will accordingly present himself in a brown billycock hat a long grey frock coat fawn-coloured trousers white spats and primrose or green gloves the recognized attire of a music-hall aristocrat a powerful though not necessarily tuneful voice is desirable for the adequate rendering of this ditty any words it is inconvenient to sing can always be spoken only a little plebeian first verse when first i met my mary ann she stood behind a barrow a bower of enchantment spread with many a dainty snack and as i gazed i felt my heart transfixed with cupid's arrow for she opened all her oysters with so fairy like a knack refrain throaty but tender she's only a little plebeian and i'm a patrician swell but she's as sweet as a roar and how i adore her no eloquence can ever tell only a fried fish vendor selling her saucers of wilkes almost defiant stress on the word whilks but for me she's a slender far more true and tender than if she wore satins and silk the grammar of the last two lines is shaky but the lion comique must try to put up with that and after all does sincere emotion ever stop to think about grammar if it does music hall audiences don't which is the main point second verse i long before her little feet to grovel in the gutter i vowed unless i won her as a wife twould drive me mad until at last a shy consent i coaxed her lips to utter for she dallied with her anglo-dutch and whispered speak to dad refrain for she's only a little plebeian and i'm a patrician swell but she's as sweet as aurora and how i adore her no eloquence can ever tell only a fried fish vendor selling her saucers of whilks but for me she's as slender far more true and tender than if she wore satins and silks third verse 
i called upon her sire and found him lowly born but brawny a noble type and sober of the british artisan i grasped his honest hand and didn't mind its being horny behold i cried a suitor for your daughter marianne though she's only a little plebeian and i'm a patrician swell but she's sweet as aurora and how i adore her no eloquence can ever tell only a fried fish vendor selling her saucers of whilks but for me she's a slender far more true and tender than if she wore satins and silks fourth verse you ask me governor to resign said he my only treasure and so a toff her fickle heart away from me as one he turned to mask his manly woe behind a pewter measure then breathing blessings through the beer he said all right my son if she's only a little plebeian and you're a patrician swell but she's as sweet as aurora and how i adore her no eloquence can ever tell only a fried fish vendor selling her saucers of whilks but for me she's a slender far more true and tender than if she wore satins and silks fifth verse the author flatters himself that in quiet sentiment and homely pathos he has seldom done anything finer than the two succeeding stanzas next i sought my noble father in his old ancestral castle and at his gouty foot my love's fond offering i laid a simple gift of shellfish in a neat brown paper parcel ah oh, sir i cried if you could know you'd love my little maid true she's only a little plebeian and i'm a patrician swell but she's as sweet as aurora and how i adore her no eloquence ever can tell only a fried fish vendor selling her saucers of whilks but for me she's as slender far more true and tender than if she wore satins and silks beneath his shaggy eyebrows soon i saw a tear-drop twinkle that artless present overcame his stubborn norman pride and when i made him taste a whilk and try a periwinkle his last objections vanished so she soon to be my bride ah she's only a little plebeian and i'm a patrician swell but she's as sweet as aurora and how i adore her no eloquence can ever tell only a fried fish vendor selling her saucers of whilks but for me she's as slender far more true and tender than if she wore satins and silks seventh verse now heraldry's a science that i haven't studied much in but i mean to ask the college if it's not against the rules that three periwinkles proper may be quartered on our scutcheon with a whilk regard and rampant on an oyster knife all ghouls refrain as she's only a little plebeian and i'm a patrician swell but she's as sweet as aurora and how i adore her no eloquence can ever tell only a fried fish vendor selling her saucers of whilks 
but for me she's a slender far more true and tender than if she wore satins and silks this little ditty which has the true unmistakable ring about it and will mr punch believes touch the hearts of any music-hall audience is entirely at the service of any talented artiste who will undertake to fit it with an appropriate melody and sing it in a spirit of becoming seriousness end of section ten read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com of the model music hall by f anstey this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by don w jenkins chapter eleven the panegyric patter this ditty is designed to give some expression to the passionate enthusiasm for nature which is occasionally observable in the music hall songstress the young lady who sings these verses will of course appear in appropriate costume that is a large white hat and feathers a crimson sunshade a pink frock high-heeled sand shoes and a liberal extent of black silk stockings a phonetic spelling has been adopted where necessary to bring out the rhyme for the convenience of the reader only as the singer will instinctively give the vowel sounds the pronunciation intended by the author the joys of the seaside first verse oh i love to sit there gazing on the boundless blue horizon when the scorching sun is blazing down on sands and ships and sea and to watch the busy figures of the happy little diggers or to listen to the niggers when they choose to come to me chorus to which the singer should sway in waltz time for i'm awfully fond of the seaside if i'd only my way i would decide to dwell evermore by the murmuring shore with the billows a blustering beside second verse then how pleasant of a morning to be up before the dawning and to sally forth a prorning e'en if nothing back you bring some young men who like fatigue go and try to pot a seagull what's the odds if it's illegal or the bird they only wing chorus for it's one of the sports of the seaside if but only my way i would decide to dwell evermore by the murmuring shore with the bellows a blustering beside third verse then would joy to go a bathing though you swim if you're a sly thing like a mermaid nimbly writhing with a foot upon the sand when you're tired of old poseidon there's the pier to promenade on Stross and sullivan and hyden form the programme of the band for there's always a band at the seaside if i'd only my way i would decide to dwell evermore by the murmuring shore when the bellows a blustering beside fourth verse and with boatmen so beguiling several parties go out sailing sitting all together smiling handing sandwiches about to the sound of concertina till they're gradually greener and they wish the ham was leaner as they sip their bottled stout chorus and they cry put us back on the seaside if i'd only my way i would decide to dwell evermore by the murmuring shore with the bellows a blustering beside fifth verse there's pleasure unalloyed in hiring hacks and going riding if you stick on tight avoiding any cropper or mishap or about the rocks you ramble over boulders slip and scramble or sit down and do a gamble playing loo or penny nap chorus penny nap is the game for the seaside 
if i'd only my way i would decide to dwell evermore by the murmuring shore with the billows a blustering beside sixth verse then it's lovely to be spooning all the glamour of the moon in with your love is banjo tuning ere flirtation can begin as along the sand you're strolling till the hour of ten is tolling and jama severely scowling asks wherever have you been then you answer i've been to the seaside if i'd only my way i would decide to dwell evermore by the murmuring shore with the billows a blustering beside seventh verse should the sky be dark and frowning and the restless winds be moaning with the breakers thunder drowning all the laughter and the glee and the day should prove a drencher out of doors you will not venture but you'll read the volumes lencher by the local library for there's sure to be one at the seaside if i'd only my wee i would decide to dwell evermore by the berbering shore with the billows a blustering beside eighth verse if the weather gets no calmer you can patronize the drama where the leading lady charmer is a chit of forty-four and a duty none would skirk is to attend the strolling circus for they'd all be in the workhouse should their antics cease to draw and they're part of the joys of the seaside if i'd only my way i would decide to dwell evermore by the burning shore with the billows a blustering beside encore verse to be used only in a case of emergency well i really must be gowing i've just time to make my bow in but i thank you for allowing me to patter on so long and if like me you're pining for the breezes there's some brine in why i'll trouble you to join in with the chorus to my song oh we're awfully fond of the seaside if i'd only my way i would decide to dwell evermore by the murmuring shore with the billows a blustering beside end of section eleven read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com of mr punch's model music hall by f anstey this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by don w jenkins chapter twelve the plaintively pathetic a music hall audience will always be exceedingly susceptible to pathos as long as they clearly understand that the song is not intended to be of a comic nature however there is very little danger of any misapprehension in the case of our present example which has as natural and affecting a little song as any that have been moving the music halls of late the ultra fastidious may possibly be repelled by what they would term the vulgarity of the title the night light ever burning by the bed but although it is true that this humble luminary is now more generally called a fairy lamp persons of true taste and refinement will prefer the homely simplicity of its earlier name the song only contains three verses which is the regulation allowance for music hall pathos the authors probably feeling that the audience could not stand any more it should be explained that the tum tum at the end of certain lines is not intended to be sung it is merely an indication to the orchestra to pinch their violins in a pizzicato manner the singer should either come on as a serious black man for burnt cork is a marvellous provocative of pathos or as his ordinary self in either case he should wear evening dress with a large brilliant on each hand the night light ever burning by the bed first verse i've been thinking of the home where my early years were spent neath the care of a kind maiden and tum 
tum tum and to go there once again has been often my intent but the railway fare's expensive so i can't tum tum still i never can forget that night when last we met oh promise me whate'er you do she said tum 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 wear flannel next your chest and when you go to rest keep a night light always burning by your bed tum tum refrain pianissimo and my eyes are dim and wet for i seem to hear them yet those solemn words at parting that she said tum 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 now mind you burn a night light twill last until it's quite light in a saucer full of water by your bed tum tum second verse i promised as she wished and her tears i gently dried as she gave me all the halfpence that she had tum 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 and through the world ever since i have wandered far and wide and been gradually going to the bad tum tum many a folly many a crime i've committed in my time for a lawless and a checkered life i've led tum 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 still i've kept the promise sworn flannel next my skin i've worn and have always burnt a night light by my bed tum tum refrain all unhallowed my pursuits off to bed i've been in boots still o'er my uneasy slumber has been shed tum 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 the moderately bright light afforded by a night light in a saucer full of water by my bed tum tum third verse to be sung with increasing solemnity a little while ago in a dream my aunt i saw in her frill surrounded nightcap there she stood tum 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 and i sought to hide my head neath the counterpane in awe and i trembled for my conscience isn't good tum tum but her countenance was mild so indulgently she smiled that i knew there was no further need for dread tum 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 she had seen the flannel vest enveloping my chest and the night light in its saucer by my bed tum tum refrain more pianissimo still but ere a word she spoke i unhappily awoke and away alas the beauteous vision fled tum 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 in mournful recitation there was nothing but the slight light of the melancholy night light that was burning in a saucer by my bed tum tum end of section twelve read and sung by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com section thirteen of mr punch's model music hall by f anstey this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording and singing by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter 13 The Military Impersonator. To be a successful military impersonator, the principal requisite is a uniform, which may be purchased for a moderate sum, second hand, in the neighborhood of almost any barracks some slight acquaintance with the sword exercise in elementary drill is useful though not absolutely essential furnished with these together with a few commanding attitudes and a song possessing a spirited martial refrain the military impersonator may be certain of an instant and striking success upon the music hall stage especially if he will condescend to avail himself of the ballad provided by mr punch as a vehicle for his peculiar talent and though we say it ourselves it's a very nice ballad to which mr mcdougall himself would find it difficult to take exception it is in three verses too 
the limit understood to be formally approved by the london county council for such productions it may be indeed that save so far as the last verse illustrates the heroism of our troops in action a heroism too real and too splendid to be rendered ridiculous even by military impersonators the song does not convey a particularly accurate notion of the manner and pursuits of an officer in the guards but then no music-hall ditty can ever be accepted as a quite infallible authority upon any social type it may undertake to depict with the single exception perhaps of the common or howling cad so that any lack of actuality here will be rather a merit than a blemish in the eyes of an indulgent audience having said so much we will proceed to our ballad which is called in the guards first verse i'm a guardsman and my manner is perhaps a bit ha ha but when you're in the guards you've got to show a spready core pronounce a spready core we look such heavy swells you see we're all aristocrats when on parade we stand arrayed in our heavy bearskin hats chorus during which the martial star will march round the stage in military order we're all luggies berties archies in the guards don't you know twisting silky long moustaches suit the action to the word here be in guards don't you know while our band is playing marches for the guards don't you know and the ladies stop to gaze upon the guards bing bang here a member of the orchestra will oblige with the cymbals while the vocalist performs a military salute as he passes to second verse with duchesses i'm and in glove with countesses i'm thick from all the knobs i get invites they say i am so chick pronounce chick it often makes me laugh to read whenever i go off guard dear bertie come to my at home on a coroneted card chorus for we're berties uggies archies in the guards don't you know with our silky long moustaches in the guards don't you know where's a regiment that marches like the guards don't you know all the darlings bless em dote upon the guards bing bang third verse here comes the singer's great chance and by merely taking a little pains he may make a tremendously effective thing out of it if he can manage to slip away between the verses and change his bearskin and scarlet coat for a solar toupee and khaki tunic at the wings it will produce an enormous amount of enthusiasm only he must not take more than five minutes over this alteration or the audience so curiously are british audiences constituted may grow impatient for his return but hark the trumpet sounds here a member of the orchestra will oblige upon the trumpet what's this the singer will take a folded paper from his breast and peruse it with attention we're ordered to the front this should be shouted we'll show the foe how carpet knights can face the battle's brunt they laugh at us as brummels but we'll prove ourselves by yards now the martial star will draw his sword and unfasten his revolver case taking up the exact pose in which he is represented upon the posters outside as you were form square mark time slope arms now tension these military evolutions should be gone through by the artist forward guards to be yelled through music chorus onward every arrow marches in the guards don't you know all the uggies berties archies off the guards don't you know they may twist their long moustaches for their guards don't you know dandies yes but dandy lions are the guards bing bang red fire and smoke at wings as curtain falls upon the military impersonator in the act of changing to a new attitude End of section 13. Read and somewhat sung by Don W. Jenkins, Rancho San Diego, California, shaggybark.blogspot.com. Of Mr. Punch's Model Music Hall by F. Anstey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Section 14 model music hall dramas number one the little crossing sweeper dramatis personae the little crossing sweeper by the unrivalled variety artist miss jenny jinks 
the duke of dillwater mr henry irving specially engaged mr punch is sure that he will cheerfully make some slight sacrifice for so good a cause and he can easily slip out and get back again between the acts of henry the eighth a policeman mr rutland barrington engaged at enormous expense during the entire run of this piece a butler his original part mr arthur cecil foot passengers flunkies burglars by the celebrated knockabout quick change troupe scene one exterior of the duke's mansion in euston square by night on the right a realistic moon by kind permission of professor herkimer is rising slowly behind a lamp-post on left centre a practicable pillar-box and crossing with real mud slow music as miss jenny jinks enters in rags with broom various characters cross the street post letters etc miss jinks follows them begging piteously for a copper which is invariably refused whereupon she assails them with choice specimens of street sarcasm which the lady may be safely trusted to improvise for herself miss jenny jinks leaning despondently against the pillar-box on which a ray of limelight falls in the opposite direction to the moon ah oh, this cruel london so marble-arted and vast where all who try to act honest are condemned to fast enter two burglars cautiously first burglar to miss jenny jinks we can put you up to a fake as will be worth your while for you seem a sharp andy lad and just our style they proceed to unfold a scheme to break into the ducal abode and offer miss jinks a share of the spoil if she will allow herself to be put through the pantry window miss jenny jinks proudly i tell yer i won't ave nothink to do with it for i ain't been used to sneak into the house of a duke to whom i haven't been introduced second burglar coarsely stow that snivel your young hemp we don't want none of that bosh miss jenny jinks with spirit you hold your jaw for when you opens your mouth there ain't much o your face left to wash the burglars retire baffled and muttering miss jinks leans against the pillar-box again but more irresolutely i've arf a mind to run after him i have and tell him i'm game to stand in but ah uh, didn't my poor mother say as burglary was a sin duke crosses stage in a hurry as he pulls out his latch-key a threepenny bit falls unregarded except by the little sweeper who pounces eagerly upon it what's this a bit o' good luck at last for a starvin' orphan boy. What shall I buy? I know. I'll have a cup of coffee and a prime saveloy. Ah, but it ain't mine. And ark, that music up in the air. A harp is heard in the flies. Can it be mother a playin' on the harp to warn her boy to beware? Awestruck. There's a angel voice that is sayin' plain solemnly him as prigs what isn't his'n is sure to be copped some day and then his time he will do in prison goes resolutely to the door and knocks the duke throws open the portals miss jenny jinks if yer please sir was you aware as you've dropped a thruppenny bit the duke after examining the coin tis the very piece i have searched for everywhere you rascal you've stolen it miss jenny jinks bitterly and that's how a duke rewards honesty in this world this line is sure of a round of applause the duke calling off policeman i give this lad in charge for a shameless attempt to rob enter policeman unless he confesses instantly who put him up to the job miss jenny jinks earnestly i've told yer the bloomin truth i have or send i may die i'm only a crossing sweeper sir but i'd scorn to tell yer a lie give me a quarter of a hour no more just time to kneel down and pray as i used to at mother's knee long ago then the copper can lead me away kneels in limelight 
the policeman turns away and uses his handkerchief violently the duke rubs his eyes the duke no blow me if i can do it for i feel my eyes are all twitching with conviction if he's good enough to kneel by his mother's side he's good enough to be in my kitchen duke dismisses constable and after disappearing into the mansion for a moment returns with a neat page's livery which he presents to the little crossing sweeper miss jenny jinks naively how much shall i ask for on this sir what you don't mean to say they're for me am i really to be a page to one of england's proud aristocracy does some steps mechanical change to scene two state apartment at the duke's magnificent furniture gilding chandeliers suits of genuine old armour statuary lent by british and kensington museums enter miss jinks with her face washed and looking particularly plump in her page's livery she wanders about stage making any humorous comments that may occur to her on the armour and statuary she might also play tricks on the butler and kiss the maids all of which will serve to relieve the piece by delicate touches of comedy and delight a discriminating audience enter the duke i hope my lad that we are making you comfortable here kindly miss jenny jinks never was in such slap-up quarters in my life sir i'll stick to yer no fear in the course of conversation the duke learns with aristocratic surprise that the page's mother was a singer at the music halls miss jenny jinks what don't know what a music hall's like and you a duke well you are a jolly old juggins here you sit down on this gilded cheer that's the ticket i'll bring you your champagne and your cigars want a light strikes match on her pantaloons now you're all comfortable the duke sits down smiling indulgently out of her way while she introduces her popular vocal character sketch of which space only permits us to give a few specimen verses first a champion comic steps upon the stage with his latest grand success sure to be the rage sixty pounds a week he easily can earn round the music halls he goes and does it each a turn under the stores in a sweet shady dell i strolled with me arm round a dear little girl and whether i kissed her you'd like me to tell well i'd rather you didn't inquire all golden her hair is she's queen of the fairies all known by the name of the lovely maria she's a regular venus but we're passed between us i'd very much rather you didn't inquire next the lady serio mincing as she walks if a note's too high for her she doesn't sing she talks what she thinks about the men you're pretty sure to learn she always has a hit at them before she's done her turn you naughty young men ow oh, you naughty young men you tell us your toffs and the real upper tin but behind all your ears is the mark of a pen so don't you deceive us you naughty young men miss jenny jinks concluding and such sir are these entertainments grand in which mirth and refinement go and in and as the duke is expressing his appreciation of the elevating effect of such performances the butler rushes in followed by two flurried footmen butler pardon this interruption my lord but i come to announce the fact that by armed housebreakers the pantry has just been attacked duke then we'll repel them each to his weapons look i know how to defend my property although i am a duke miss jinks snatching sword from one of the men in armour with such a weapon i their hash will settle you'll lend it won't your old britannia metal shouts and firing without the footmen hide under sofa that flunky see though danger may encircle us a british buttons ain't afeard of burgulous tremendous firing during which the burglars are supposed to be repulsed with heavy loss by the duke butler and page miss jinks here i say duke i saved your life didn't you know 
a parting shot upon which she staggers back with a ringing scream the brutes they've been and shot me mother oh dies in limelight and great agony the footmen come out from under the sofa and regard with sorrowing admiration the lifeless form of the little crossing sweeper which the duke as curtains fall covers reverently with the best tablecloth end of section fourteen read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com of mr punch's model music hall by f anstey this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by don w jenkins with some attempts at singing section fifteen number two joe the jam eater a musical spectacular and sensational interlude dedicated respectfully to mr mcdougall and the london county council the music-hall dramatist like shakespeare and moliere has a right to take his material from any source that may seem good to him mr punch therefore makes no secret of the fact that he has based the following piece upon the well-known poem of the purloiner by the sisters jane and ann taylor who were not as might be too hastily concluded song and dance duettists but two estimable ladies who composed cautionary verses for the young and whose works are a perfect mine of wealth for moral dramatists in this dramatic version the author has tried to infuse something of the old greek sense of an overruling destiny without detriment to prevailing ideas of moral responsibility those who have the misfortune to be born with a propensity for illicit jam may learn from our drama the terrible results of failing to overcome it early in life joe the jam eater dramatis personae jam loving joe by that renowned melodramatic serio comic miss connie curdler joe's mother the very part for miss bancroft if she can only be induced to make her reappearance john a gardener by the great pink-eyed unmusical zulu jim jam the fermentation fiend by mr beerbaum tree who has kindly consented to undertake the part chorus of plum and pear gatherers from the savoy by kind permission of mr doily cart scene the storeroom at sunset with view of exterior of jam cupboard and orchard in distance enter joe as joe was at play near the cupboard one day when he thought no one saw but himself vide poem joe dreamily tis passing strange that i so partial am to playing in the neighbourhood of jam here miss curdler will introduce her great humorous satirical medley illustrative of the sports of childhood and entitled some little gimes we all of us have plied after which enter joe's mother followed by john and the chorus with baskets ladders etc for gathering fruit his mother and john to the garden had gone to gather ripe pears and ripe plums poem joe's mother with forced cheerfulness let's hope my friends to find our pears and plums unharmed by wopses and untouched by wums chorus signify assent in the usual manner by holding up the right hand solo john fruit when gathered ripe is wholesome otherwise if eaten green once i know a boy who stole some with a glance at joe who turns aside to conceal his confusion his internal pangs were keen chorus virtuously tis the doom of all who are mean their internal pangs are keen joe's mother aside by what misgivings is a mother tortured i'll keep my eye on joseph in the orchard she invites him with a gesture to follow joe earnestly nay mother here i'll stay till you've done temptation is ever best to shun joe's mother so laudable his wish i would not cross it mysteriously 
he knows not there are jam pots in yon closet chorus away we go tripping from boughs to be stripping each pear plum and pippin pomona supplies when homeward we've brought em these products of autumn will carefully sort em one of our old music hall rhymes according to size repeat as they caper out joe's mother after one fond lingering look behind follows the voices are heard more and more faintly in the distance stage darkens the last ray of sunset illumines the key of jam cupboard door joe at last i am alone suppose i tried that cupboard just to see what's kept inside seems drawn towards it by some fatal fascination there might be guava jelly and a plummy cake for such a prize i'd laugh to scorn a stomach ache laughs a stomach ache to scorn and yet hesitating who knows a pill perchance a powder desperately what then to scorn i laugh them even louder fetches chair and unlocks cupboard doors fall open with loud clang revealing interior of jam closet painted by hawes craven joe mounts chair to explore shelves how sorry i am he ate raspberry jam and currants that stood on the shelf vide poem joe speaking with mouth full and back to audience tis raspberry of all the jams my favorite i'll clear the pot whatever i have to pay for it and finish up with currants from the shelf who'll ever see me the demon of the jam closet rising slowly from an immense pot of preserves no one but myself the cupboard is lit up by an infernal glare courteously lent by the lyceum management from faust properties weird music joe turns slowly and confronts the demon with awe-struck eyes n b great opportunity for powerful acting here the demon with a bland sneer pray don't mind me i will await your leisure joe automatically of your acquaintance sir i've not the pleasure who are you wherefore have you intervened the demon quietly my name is jim jam occupation fiend joe cowering limply on his chair oh mr fiend i know it's very wrong of me demon politely don't mention it but please to come along of me joe imploringly do let me off this once ha you're relenting you smile demon grimly tis nothing but my jam fermenting catches joe's ankle and assists him to descend joe you drive me mad demon carelessly i may before i've done with you joe what do you want demon darkly to have a little fun with you of fiendish humour now i'll give a specimen chases him round and round stage and proceeds to smear him hideously with jam joe piteously oh don't i feel so sticky what a mess i'm in demon with affected sympathy that is the worst of jam it's apt to stain you to joe as he frantically endeavors to remove the traces of his crime i see you're busy so i'll not detain you vanishes down star trap with a diabolical laugh cupboard doors close with a clang all lights down joe stands gazing blankly for some moments and then drags himself off stage his mother and john with pear and plum gatherers bearing laden baskets appear at doors at back of scene in faint light of torches re-enter joe bearing a candle and wringing his hands joe out jammed spot what will these hands never be clean here's the smell of the raspberry jam still all the powders of gregory cannot unsweeten this little hand moaning oh 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 this passage has been accused of bearing too close a resemblance to one in a popular stage play if so the coincidence is purely accidental as the dramatist is not in the habit of reading such profane literature joe's mother 
ah what an icy dread my heart benumbs see stains on all his fingers and his thumbs what joe was about his mother found out when she looked at his fingers and thumbs poem again lay joseph tis your mother speak to her joe tonelessly as before lady i know you not touches lower part of waistcoat but prithee undo this button i think i have jam in all my veins and i would fain sleep when i am gone lay me in a plain white jelly-pot with a parchment cover and on the label write but come nearer i have a secret for your ear alone there are strange things in some cupboards demons should keep in the dust-bin with a ghastly smile i know not what ails me but i am not feeling at all well joe's mother stands a few steps from him with her hands twisted in her hair and stares at him in speechless terror joe to the chorus i would shake hands with you all were not my fingers so sticky we eat marmalade but we know not what it is made of hush if jim jam comes again tell him that i am not at home loo, loo, loo. all with conviction some shock has turned his brine joe sitting down on floor and weaving straws in his hair my curse upon him that invented jam let us all play tibbets laughs vacantly all gather round him shaking their heads his mother falls fainting at his feet as curtain falls upon a strong and moral though undeniably gloomy denouement end of section fifteen read and sung to some extent by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com Of Mr. Punch's Model Music Hall by F. Anstey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Section 16. The Man Trap. A thrilling moral musical sensation sketch in one scene. Dramatis Personae. William, a good boy. Mr. Harry Nichols. Thomas, a bad boy mr herbert campbell who have kindly offered their services benjamin neither one thing nor the other mr samuel super the monster man trap mr george conquest scene an elaborate set representing on extreme left a portion of the high road and wall dividing it from an orchard realistic apple and pear trees laden with fruit time about four o'clock on a hot afternoon enter william and thomas hand in hand a long road they ignore the dividing wall and advance to front of stage duet william and thomas william i'm a regular model boy i am so please make no mistake it's thomas who's the bad un i'm the good thomas yes i delight in naughtiness for naughtiness's sake and i wouldn't be like william if i could chorus william ever since i could toddle my conduct's been model there's oh such a difference between me and him thomas while still in the cradle i orders obeyed ill and now i've grown into a awful young limb together yes he's now i've grown into a awful young limb i've made up my mind not to imitate him here they dance second verse william if someone hits him in the eye he always hits them back when i am struck my ma i merely tell on passing fat pigs in a lane he'll give em each a whack thomas impenitently and jolly fun it is to hear em yell chorus william ever since i could toddle my conduct's been model there's oh such a difference between me and him thomas while still in the cradle i orders obeyed ill and now i've grown into a awful young limb together yes he's now i've grown into a awful young limb i've made up my mind not to imitate him here they dance third verse he's always cribbing coppers which he spends on lollipops 
thomas a sheriff which you've never yet refused william a stone he'll shy at frogs and toads and anything that hops thomas while well, you look in and seem to be amused chorus william ever since i could toddle my conduct's been model there's oh such a difference between me and him thomas while still in the cradle i orders obeyed ill and now i've grown into a awful young limb together yes he's now i've grown into a awful young limb i've made up my mind not to imitate him here they dance fourth verse william as soon as school is over thomas goes a hunting squirrels or butterflies he'll capture in his hat thomas you play at kissing in the ring with all the little girls william demurely well thomas i can see no harm in that chorus william ever since i could toddle my conduct's been model there's oh such a difference between me and him thomas while still in the cradle i orders obeyed ill and now i've grown into a awful young limb yes he's now i've grown into a awful young limb i've made up my mind not to imitate him here they dance fifth verse william ah oh, thomas if you don't reform you'll come to some bad end thomas oh william put your head inside a bag william no oh, thomas that i cannot till you promise to amend thomas why william what a chap you are to nag chorus and dance william ever since i could toddle my conduct's been model there's oh such a difference between me and him thomas while still in the cradle i orders obeyed ill and now i've grown into a awful young limb together yes he's now i've grown into a awful young limb i've made up my mind not to imitate him thomas returns to road and regards the apple trees longingly over top of wall thomas hi william look what apples there don't you see and pears my eye just ain't they looking juicy william nay thomas since you're bent upon a sin i will walk on and visit benjamin exit william l to e while thomas proceeds to scale the wall and climb the boughs of the nearest pear tree melodramatic music the monster man-trap stealthily emerges from long grass below and fixes a baleful eye on the unconscious thomas thomas i'll fill my pockets and on pears i'll feast sees man-trap and staggers oh lor whatever is that ugly beast hi help here call him off the monster tis vain to holler my hoarders are all trespassers to swaller you just come down i'm waiting here to catch you indignantly you don't expect i'm coming up to fetch you thomas politely oh not if it would inconvenience you sir in agonized aside i feel my grip grow every moment looser the monster in a slow uncouth manner proceeds to scramble up the tree oh here's a go the horrid thing can climb too late i do repent me of my crime terrific sensation chase the monster man trap leaps from bough to bough with horrible agility and eventually secures his prey and leaps with it to the ground thomas in the monster's jaws i'm sure you seem a kind good-natured creature you will not harm me monster no i'll only eat yer thomas slowly vanishes down its cavernous jaws faint yells are heard at intervals then nothing but a dull champing sound after which dead silence the monster smiles with an air of repletion re-enter william from the right with benjamin benjamin i'm very glad you came but where is thomas william severely tom is a wicked boy and better from us for on the road he stopped to scale a wall sees man-trap and starts what's that benjamin it will not hurt good boys at all it's only father's man-trap why so pale william the self-same tree the wall that tom would scale where's thomas now ah oh, tom the wilful pride of you the man-trap affects an elaborate unconsciousness benjamin with sudden enlightenment man-trap 
i do believe poor tom's inside of you that sort of smile's exceedingly suspicious the man-trap endeavours to hide in the grass william oh monster give him back tis true he's vicious and had no business to go making free with you but think so bad a boy will disagree with you william and benjamin kneel in attitudes of entreaty on either side of the man-trap which shows signs of increasing emotion as the song proceeds benjamin sings man-trap bitter are distresses that you have unkindly pinned in your innermost recesses one who used to be our friend william sings in his downward course arrest him he may take a virtuous tack pause a while ere you digest him make an effort bring him back the man-trap is convulsed by a violent heave william and benjamin bend forward in an agony of expectation until a small shoe and the leg of thomas's pantaloons are finally emitted from the monster's jaws benjamin exultantly see william now he's coming here's his shoe for you the man-trap with an accent of genuine regret i'm sorry but that's all that i can do for you william raising the shoe and the leg of the pantaloons and holding them sorrowfully at arm's length he's met the fate which moralists all promise is the end of such depraved careers as thomas's oh benjamin take warning by it be time more brightly but now to wash our hands tis nearly tea-time exeunt william and benjamin to wash their hands as curtain falls n b this finale is more truly artistic and in accordance with modern dramatic ideas than the conventional picture End of section 16 read by Don W. Jenkins, Rancho San Diego, California, shaggybark.blogspot.com Seventeen. Oh, Mr. Punch's Model Music Hall by F. Anstey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Section 17. Number 4 the fatal pin our present example is pure tragedy of the most ambitious kind and is perhaps a little in advance of the taste of a music-hall audience of the present day when the fusion between the theatres and the music-halls is complete when miss bessie bellwood sings what cheer Rhea, at the lyceum and mr henry irving gives his compressed version of hamlet at the trocadero when there is a general levelling up of culture and removal of prejudice then and not till then will this powerful little play meet with the appreciation which is its due the main idea is suggested by the mrs taylor's well-known poem the pin though the dramatist has gone further than the poetess in working out the notion of nemesis the fatal pin a tragedy dramatis personae emily heedless by either miss vesta tilly or mrs bernard veer peter paragon mr forbes robertson or mr arthur roberts only he mustn't sing the good young man who died first and second bridesmaids miss maud millet and miss annie hughes scene emily's boudoir sumptuously furnished with a screen and sofa see door right leading to emily's bedchamber door l emily discovered in loose wrapper and reclining in uncomfortable position on sofa emily dreamily this day do i become the envied bride of peter justly surnamed paragon and much i wonder what in me he found he who perfection so personifies that he could condescend and i to cast on faulty feather-headed emily how solemn is the stillness all around me a loud bang is heard behind screen methought i heard the dropping of a pin perhaps i should arise and search for it yet why on second thoughts disturb myself since i am by my settlements to have a handsome sum allowed for pin money nay since thou claimst thy freedom little pin i lack the heart to keep thee prisoner go then and join the great majority of fallen vagrant and unregarded pinhood my bliss is too supreme at such an hour to heed such infidelities as thine falls into a happy reverie enter first and second bridesmaids 
first and second bridesmaids but now emily not yet attired nay haste for peter will be here anon they hurry her off by right door just as peter paragon enters left in bridal array n b the exigencies of the drama are responsible for his making his appearance here instead of waiting as is more usual at the church peter meditatively the golden sands of my celibacy are running low soon falls the final green yet even now the glass i would not turn my emily is not without her faults was not without them i should rather say for during ten idyllic years of courtship by precept and example i have striven to mould her to a helpmate fit for me now thank the gods my labours are complete she stands redeemed from all her giddiness here he steps upon the pin and utters an exclamation ha huh, what is this i'm wounded agony with what a darting pain my foot's transfixed i'll summon help with calm courage yet stay i would not dim this nuptial day by any sombre cloud i'll bear this stroke alone and now to probe the full extent of my calamity seats himself on sofa in such a position as to be concealed by the screen from all but the audience and proceeds to remove his boot ye powers of perfidy it is a pin i must know more of this for it is meet such criminal neglect should be exposed severe shall be that housemaid's punishment who's proved to be responsible for this but soft i hear a step enter first and second bridesmaids who hunt diligently upon the carpet without observing peter's presence emily's voice within oh search i pray you it must be there my own ears heard it fall peter betrays growing uneasiness the bridesmaids indeed we fail to see it anywhere emily entering distractedly in bridal costume with a large rent in her train you have no eyes i tell you let me help it must be found or i am all undone in vain my cushion i have cut in two twas void of all but stuffing gracious heavens to think that all my future bliss depends on the evasive malice of a pin peter behind screen starts violently peter aside a pin what dire misgivings wring my heart hops forward with a cold dignity holding one foot in his hand you seem in some excitement emily emily wildly you peter tell me have you found a pin peter with deadly calm unhappy girl i have to bridesmaids withdraw a while and should we need you we will summon you exeunt bridesmaids emily and peter stand facing each other for some moments in dead silence the pin is found for i have trodden on it and may for aught i know be lamed for life speak emily what is that maid's desert whose carelessness has led to this mishap emily in the desperate hope of shielding herself why should the fault be traced to any maid instant dismissal shall be her reward with a month's wages paid in lieu of notice peter with passionless severity from your own lips i judge you emily did they not own just now that you had heard the falling of a pin yet he did not behold the outcome of your negligence extends his injured foot emily oh let me kiss the place and make it well peter coldly withdrawing foot keep your caresses till i ask for them my wound goes deeper than you wot of yet and by that disregarded pin is pricked the iridescent bubble of illusion emily slowly indeed i do not wholly comprehend peter her patience and i will be plainer yet mine is a complex nature emily magnanimous but still methodical an injury i freely can forgive forget it striking his chest never she who leaves about pins on the floor to pierce a lover's foot will surely plant a thorn within the side of him whose fate it is to be her husband emily dragging herself towards him on her knees have pity on me peter i was mad peter with emotion how can i choose but pity thee poor soul who for the sake of temporary ease hast forfeited the bliss that had been thine you could not stoop to pick a pin up why because forsooth twas but a paltry pin 
yet duly husbanded that self-same pin had served you to secure your gaping train your self-respect and me emily wailing what have i done peter i will not reproach you emily nor would i dwell upon my wounded soul the pain of which increases momently i part from your friendship and in proof that faded instrument i leave with you presenting her with the pin which she accepts mechanically which the frail link between us twain has severed i can dispense with it for in my cuff shows her his coat cuff in which a row of pins heads is perceptible i carry others gainst the time of need my poor success in life i trace to this that never yet i passed a pin unheeded emily and is that all you have to say to me peter i think so save that i shall wish you well and pray that henceforth you may bear in mind what vast importance lies in seeming trifles emily with a pale smile peter your lesson is already learned for precious has this pin become to me since by its aid i gain oblivion thus stabs herself peter coldly nay these are histrionics emily assists her to sofa emily i'd skill enough to find a vital spot do not withdraw it yet my time is short and i have much to say before i die faintly be gentle with my rabbits when i'm gone give my canary chickweed now and then i think there is no more ah one last word earnestly warn them that they must not cut our wedding cake and then the pastry cook may take it back peter deeply moved would you have shown this thoughtfulness before kneels by the sofa emily tis now too late and clearly do i see that i was never worthy of you peter peter gently tis not for me to contradict you now you did your best to be so emily emily a blessing on you for those generous words now tell me peter how is your poor foot peter the agony decidedly abates and i can almost bear a boot again emily and i die happy kiss me peter ah dies peter in peace she passed away i'm glad of that although that peace was purchased by a lie i shall not bear a boot for many days thus ends our wedding morn and she poor child has paid the penalty of heedlessness curtain falls whereupon unless mr punch is greatly mistaken there will not be a dry eye in the house end of section seventeen read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com of mr punch's model music hall by f anstey this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by don w jenkins section eighteen number five a melodramatic didactic vaudeville suggested by the wooden doll and the wax doll by the misses jane and ann taylor dramatis personae blanchardine brunette by the celebrated sisters stilton the champion duettists and clog dancers fanny furbelo by miss sylvia sealskin by kind permission of the gaiety management frank manley by mr henry neville scene a sunny glade in kensington gardens between the serpentine and round pond enter blanchardine and brunette with their arms thrown affectionately around one another blanchardine is carrying a large and expressionless wooden doll duet and step dance blanchardine oh i do adore brunette dances tippity tappity tappity tippity tippity tappity tip tap brunette blanchardine's the sweetest pet dances tippity tappity tappity tippity tippity tappity tip tap together when the sun is high we come out to ply nobody is nigh all is mirth and joy with a parasol we'll protect our doll like a mossy bed for her wooden head combination step dance during which both watch their feet with an air of detached and slightly amused interest as if they belonged to some other persons 
clickety clack clickety clack clickety 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 clack clackety clickety clickety clackety clackety clickety clack repeat ad lib blanchidine apologetically to audience her taste in dress is rather plain dances tippity tappity tappity tippity tippity tappity tip tap brunette in pitying aside it is a pity she's so vain dances tippity tappity tappity tippity tippity tappity tip tap blanchidine tis a shame to smile but she's shocking style it is quite a trial still she makes a foil brunette often i've a job to suppress a sob she is such a snob when she meets a knob step dance as before n b in consideration of the well-known difficulty that most popular variety artists experience in the metrical delivery of decasyllabic couplets the lines which follow have been written as they will most probably be spoken blanchidine looking off with alarm why here comes fanny furbelow a new frock from paris in she'll find me with brunette it's too embarrassing aside to brunette brunette my love i know such a pretty game we'll play at poor timberina's ill and the seaside she ought to stay at the serpentine's the seaside let's pretend and you shall take her there hypocritically you're such a friend brunette with simplicity oh yes that will be splendid blanchidine and then we can go and have a dip in a bathing machine blanchidine resigns the wooden doll to brunette who skips off with it left as fanny furbelow enters right carrying a magnificent wax doll fanny languidly ah oh, how do do isn't this heat too frightful and so you're quite alone blanchidine nervously oh quite oh yes i always am alone when there's nobody with me this is a little specimen of the lady's humorous gag at which she is justly considered a proficient fanny drawling delightful when i was wondering only a little while ago if i should meet a creature that i know allow me my new doll the lady minnie introducing doll blanchidine rapturously oh what a perfect love fanny she ought to be for a guinea here you may nurse her for a little while be careful for her frock's the latest style gives blanchidine the wax doll she's the best wax and has three changes of clothing for those cheap wooden dolls i've quite a loathing blanchidine hastily oh so have i they're not to be endured re-enter brunette with the wooden doll which she tries to press upon blanchidine much to the latter's confusion brunette i've brought poor timberina back completely cured why aren't you pleased your face is looking so cloudy fanny haughtily is she a friend of yours this little dowdy slow music blanchidine after an internal struggle oh no what an idea why i don't even know her by name some vulgar child lets the wax doll fall unregarded on the gravel brunette indignantly oh what a horrid shame i see now why you sent us to the serpentine blanchidine heartlessly there's no occasion to flare up like turpentine brunette ungrammatically i'm not disown your doll and thrust me aside too the one thing left for both of us is suicide yes timberina us no more she cherishes bitterly well the round pond a handy place to perish is rushes off stage with wooden doll blanchidine making a feeble attempt to follow come back brunette don't leave me thus in charity fanny with contempt well i'll be off since you seem to prefer vulgarity blanchidine no stay but ah uh, she said what if she meant it fanny not she and if she did we can't prevent it blanchidine relieved that's true we'll play and think no more about her fanny sarcastically we may just manage to get on without her so come 
perceives doll lying face upwards on path you odious girl what have you done left lady milly lying in the blazing sun twas done on purpose oh you thing perfidious stamps you knew she'd melt and get completely hideous don't answer me miss i wish we'd never met you're only fit for persons like brunette picks up doll and exit in passion grand sensation descriptive soliloquy by blanchidine to melodramatic music blanchidine gone ah i am rightly punished what would i not give now to have homely little brunette and dear old wooden-headed timberina back again she wouldn't melt in the sun where are they now great heavens that threat that thrash resolve i remember all twas in the direction of the pond they vanished peeping anxiously between trees are they still in sight yes i see them brunette has reached the water's edge what is she purposing now she kneels on the rough gravel she is making timberina kneel too how calm and resolute they both appear shuddering i dare not look further but ah i must i must horror i saw her boots flash for an instant in the bright sunlight and now the ripples have closed smiling over her little black stockings help save her somebody help joy a gentleman has appeared on the scene how handsome how brave he looks he has taken in the situation at a glance with quiet composure he removes his coat oh don't trouble about folding it up and why why remove your gloves when there is not a moment to be lost now with many injunctions he entrusts his watch to a bystander who retires overcome by emotion and now o oh, gallant heroic soul now he is sending his toy terrier into the seething water straining eagerly forward ah the dog paddles bravely out he has reached the spot oh he has passed it he is trying to catch a duck dog dog is this a time for pursuing ducks at last he understands he dives he brings up agony a small tin cup again this time surely what only an old pot hat oh this dog is a fool and still the round pond holds its dread secret once more yes no yes it is timberina thank heaven she breathes but brunette can she have stuck in the mud at the bottom ha she too is rescued saved ha 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 saved 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 swoons hysterically amid deafening applause enter frank manley supporting brunette who carries timberina blanchidine wildly what do i see you safe beloved brunette brunette yes thanks to his courage and i'm not even wet frank modestly they spare your compliments to rescue beauty when in distress is every hero's duty blanchidine brunette forgive i'm cured of all my folly brunette heartily of course i will my dear and so will dolly grand trio and step dance with tippity tappity and clickety clack refrain as finale End of section 18. Read by Don W. Jenkins, Rancho San Diego, California, shaggybark.blogspot.com. Teen of Mr. Punch's Model Music Hall by F. Anstey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Section 19 number six coming of age our present drama represents an attempt to illustrate upon the music hall stage the eternal truth that race will tell in the long run despite but on second thoughts it does not quite prove that though it certainly shows the unerring accuracy of parental at least that is not exactly its tendency either and the fact is that mr punch is more than a little mixed himself as to the precise theory which it is designed to enforce he hopes however that as a realistic study of patrician life and manners it will possess charms for a democratic audience coming of age a grand social psychological comedy drama in one act dramatis personae the earl of berntelmond the countess of berntelmond his wife robert henry viscount bulsay their son and heir the lady rose caramel niece to the earl 
Horehound, Mrs. Horehound, Coltsfoot Horehound, traveling as the celebrated combination corf drop troupe in their refined and elegant drawing room entertainment. Tenantry. Scene. The great quadrangle of Hardbake Castle. Banners, mottoes, decorations, etc. On the steps, right, the earl supported by his wife son and niece is discovered in the act of concluding a speech to six tenantry who display all the enthusiasm that is reasonably to be expected at nine pence a night the earl patting lord bullsay's shoulder i might say more gentlemen in praise of my dear son lord bullsay here i might dwell on his extreme sweetness his strongly marked character the variety of his tastes and the singular attraction he has for children of all ages but i forbear i will merely announce that on this day the day he has selected for attaining his majority he has gratified us all by plighting troth to his cousin the lady rose caramel with whose dulcet and clinging disposition he has always possessed the greatest natural affinity lord bullsay aside to lady rose ah rose would such happiness could last but my heart misgives me strangely why i know not lady rose say not so dear bullsay have you not just rendered me the happiest little patrician in the whole peerage lord bullsay tis true and yet and yet pooh let me snatch the present hour snatches it the earl and now let the revels commence enter the corf drop troop who give their marvellous entertainment entitled the three surprise packets after which whorehound this will conclude the first portion of our entertainment lords ladies and gentlemen and while my wife and partner retires to change her costume for the second part i should be glad of the opportunity of a short personal explanation with the noble hurl on my right exit mrs horehound the earl graciously i will hear you fellow aside strange how familiar his speeches seem to me whorehound the fact is your lordship's celebrating the coming of age of the wrong hair sensation that is the six tenantry shift from one leg to the other and murmur feebly oh i can prove it twenty-one years ago slow music i was on your lordship's service as gamekeeper ed whip and hextry waiter my son and yours was born the self-same day and my whole dutch was selected to act as foster mother to the youthful lord will tells a long and not entirely original story marvellous resemblance between infants only distinguishable by green and magenta bows etc etc soon after your lordship discharged me at a moment's notice the earl haughtily i did upon discovering that you were in the habit of surreptitiously carrying off kitchen stuff concealed within your umbrella but proceed with your narration whorehound i swore to be avenged and so common form again the shifted bows consequently as a moment's reflection will convince you the young man on the steps in the buttonhole and tall at is my lawful son while the real viscount is presenting colt's foot who advances modestly on his hands ear renewed sensation the earl this is indeed a startling piece of intelligence to lord b and so sir it appears that your whole life has been one consistent imposition a gilded lie lord bullsay let my youth and inexperience at the time sir plead as my best excuse the earl nothing can excuse the fact that you you a low-born son of the people have monopolized the training the tenderness and education which were the due of your patrician foster brother to colt's foot approach my injured long-lost boy and tell me how i may atone for these years of injustice and neglect colt's foot well governor if you could send out for a pot o four arf it ud be a beginning like the earl 
you shall have every luxury that befits your rank but first remove that incongruous garb coltsfoot to lord bullsay these ere togs belongs to you now young feller and i reckon exchange ain't no robbery lord bullsay with emotion to countess mother can you endure to behold your son in tights and spangles on the very day of his majority countess coldly on the contrary it is my wish to see him attired as soon as possible in a more appropriate costume lord bullsay to lady rose rose you at least have not changed tell me you will love me still even on the precarious summit of an acrobat's pole lady rose scornfully really the presumptuous familiarity of the lower orders is perfectly appalling the earl to countess as lord bullsay and coltsfoot retire to exchange costumes at last pauline i understand why i could never feel towards bullsay the affection of a parent often i have reproached myself for a coldness i could not overcome countess and i too nature was too strong for us but oh the joy of recovering our son of finding him so strong so supple so agile never yet has our line boasted an heir that can feed himself from a fork strapped on to his dexter heel the earl with emotion our beloved boneless boy re-enter coltsfoot in modern dress and lord bullsay in tights coltsfoot don't i look slap up okay and no mistake oh i am having a beano all what easy gaiety and unforced animation the earl my dear boy let me present you to your fiance rose my love this is your legitimate lover coltsfoot oh all right i've no objections only there'll be ructions with the young woman in the tight-rope line as i've been keeping company with that's all the earl your foster brother will act as your substitute there proudly my son must make no misalliance rose timidly and if it would give you any pleasure i'm sure i could soon learn the tight-rope coltsfoot not at your time of life miss and besides hang it now i'm a lord i can't have my wife doing nothing low the earl spoken like a true burntelmond now let the revels recommence re-enter mrs whorehound whorehound to lord bullsay now then stupid tumble can't you what are you ear for lord bullsay to the earl since it is your command i obey though it is ill tumbling with a heavy heart turns head over heels laboriously colt's foot call that a somersault ere old my at giving tall hat to lady rose i'll show yer how to do a turn throws a triple somersault all what condescension how his aristocratic superiority is betrayed even in competition with those to the manner born mrs whorehound still in ignorance of the transformation Halt! i have kept silence till now even from my husband but the time has come when i must speak think you that if he were indeed a lord he could turn such somersaults as those no no i will reveal all tells same old story except that she herself from ambitious motives transposed the infant's bows now do with me what you will whorehound confusion so my ill-judged action did but redress the wrong i designed to effect the earl annoyed this is a serious matter reflecting as it does upon the legitimacy of my lately recovered son what proof have you woman of your preposterous allegation mrs whorehound none my lord but these exhibits two faded bunches of ribbon the earl i cannot resist such overwhelming evidence fight against it as i may lord bullsay triumphantly and so o oh father mother rose dear dear rose i am no acrobat after all the earl sternly would you were anything half so serviceable to the community sir i have no superstitious reverence for rank and am i trust sufficiently enlightened to discern worth and merit even beneath the spangled vest of the humblest acrobat your foster brother brief as our acquaintance has been has already endeared himself to all hearts 
while you have borne a trifling reverse of fortune with sullen discontent and conspicuous incapacity he has perfected himself in a lofty and distinguished profession during years spent by you sir in idly cumbering the earth of eton and oxford shall i allow him to suffer by a purely accidental coincidence never i owe him reparation and it shall be paid to the utmost penny from this day i adopt him as my eldest son and the heir to my earldom and all other real and personal effects see robert henry that you treat your foster brother as your senior in future coltsfoot to lord bullsay way yo old matey i don't bear no malice i don't give us your ducks offering hand the count ah bullsay try to be worthy of such generosity lord bullsay grasps coltsfoot's hand in silence lady rose and pray understand that whether mr coltsfoot be viscount or acrobat it can make no difference whatever to the disinterested affection with which i have lately learnt to regard him gives her hand to coltsfoot who squeezes it with ardour coltsfoot pleasantly well father mother your noble hurlship and lady foster brother bullsay and my pretty little sweetheart ear what do you all say to goin inside and shunting a little garbage and shifting a drop or so of lotion eh the earl a most sensible suggestion my boy let us make these ancient walls the scene of the blithest ahem beano they have ever yet beheld cheers from tenantry as the earl leads the way into the castle with mrs horehound followed by horehound with the countess and coltsfoot with lady rose lord bullsay discomfited and abashed entering last as curtain falls end of section nineteen read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com twenty of mr punch's model music hall by f anstey this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by don w jenkins section twenty number seven reclaimed or how little elfie taught her grandmother characters lady beldame a dowager of the deepest dye monkshood her steward and confidential minion little elfie an angel child this part has been specially constructed for that celebrated infant actress banjoist and variety comedian miss birdie callowchick scene the panelled room at nightshade hall lady beldame discovered preparing parcels old and unloved yes the longer i live the more plainly do i perceive that i am not a popular old woman have i not acquired the reputation in the county of being a witch my neighbour sir vivi long asked me publicly only the other day when i would like my broom ordered and that minx lady violet powdray has pointedly mentioned old cats in my hearing pergament my family lawyer has declined to act for me any longer merely because monkshood rack-rented some of the tenants a little too energetically in the torture chamber as if in these hard times one was not justified in putting the screw on then the villagers scowl when i pass the very children shrink from me a childish voice outside the window yeah oo sold herself to old bogey for a pound of tea and a set of new teeth that is when they do not insult me by suggestions of bargains that are not even business-like no matter i will be avenged upon them all i all tis christmas time the season at which sentimental fools exchange gifts and good wishes for once i too will distribute a few seasonable presents inspecting parcels are my arrangements complete the bundle of choice cigars in each of which a charge of nitroglycerine has been dexterously inserted the lip salve made up from my own prescription with corrosive sublimate by a venal chemist in the vicinity 
the art flower pot containing a fine specimen of the upas plant swathed in impermeable sacking the sweets compounded with sugar of lead the packet of the best rat's bane yes nothing has been omitted now to summon my faithful monkshood ha he is already at hand cord as monkshood enters monkshood your ladyship a child whose sole luggage is a small bandbox and a large banjo is without and requests the favour of a personal interview lady beldame reproachfully and you who have been with me all these years and know my ways omitted to let loose the bloodhounds you grow careless monkshood monkshood wounded your ladyship is unjust i did unloose the bloodhounds but the ferocious animals merely sat up and begged the child had took the precaution to provide herself with a bun lady beldame no matter she must be removed i care not how monkshood there may be room for one more a little one in the old well the child mentioned that she was your ladyship's granddaughter but i presume that will make no difference lady beldame disquieted what then she must be the child of my only son poldoodle whom for refusing to cut off the entail i had falsely accused of adulterating milk and transported beyond the seas she comes hither to denounce and reproach me monkshood she must not leave this place alive you hear monkshood i require no second bidding ha the child she comes cord little elfie trips in with touching self-confidence elfie in a charming little cockney accent yes grandma it's me little elfie come all the way from australia to see you because i thought you must be so lonely all by yourself my papa often told me what a long score he owed you and how he hoped to pay you off if he lived but he went out to business one day pa was a bushranger you know and worked oh so hard and never came back to his little elfie so poor little elfie has come to live with you monkshood will you have the child removed now my lady lady beldame undecidedly not yet not yet i have other work for you these christmas gifts to be distributed amongst my good friends and neighbours handing parcels first this bundle of cigars to sir v v long with my best wishes that such a connoisseur in tobacco may find them sufficiently strong the salve for lady violet powdre with my love and it should be rubbed on the last thing at night the plant you will take to the little permigants twill serve them for a christmas tree this packet to be diluted in a barrel of beer which you will see broached upon the village green these sweetmeats for distribution among the most deserving of the school children elfie throwing her arms around lady beldame's neck i do like you grandma you have such a kind face and oh what pains you must have taken to find something that will do for everybody lady beldame disengaging herself peevishly yes yes child i trust that what i have chosen will indeed do for everybody but i do not like to be messed about monkshood you know what you have to do elfie oh i am sure he does grandma see how benevolently he smiles you're such a good old man you will take care that all the poor people are fed won't you monkshood with a sinister smile ah missy i've helped to settle a many people's ash in my time elfie innocently what do they all get hash how nice i like hash but what else do you give them monkshood grimly gruel missy aside i must get out of this or this innocent child's prattle will unman me exit with parcels elfie you seem so sad and troubled grandma let me sing you one of the songs with which i drew a smile from my poor dear pa in happier days lady beldame no no some other time aside pshaw why should i dread the effect of her simple melodies aloud sing child if you will elfie 
how glad i am that i brought my banjo sings dar is a lovely yeller girl that tickles me to death she'll dance de room of darkies down and take away their breath when she sits down to supper every colored gentleman as she gets her upper lip for a plate o' possum dip cries woo loose indian chorus dear granny woo loose indy woo loose indy woo loose indian at the rate that you are stuffin you will never leave us nothin so woe miss indian to lady beldam who after joining in chorus with deep emotion has burst into tears why you are weeping dear grandmother lady beldam nay tis nothing child but have you no songs which are less sad elfie oh yes i know plenty of plantation ditties more cheerful than that sings oh i hear a gentle whisper from the days of long ago when i used to be a happy darky slave trump a trump but now i's got to labor with the shovel and de hoo for old massa lies a sleepin in his grave trump trump chorus poor old massa poor old massa poor old massa that i never more shall see he was let off by the jury way down in old missouri but they lynched him on a persimmon tree elfie you smile at last dear grandma i would sing to you again but i am so very very sleepy lady beldame poor child you have had a long journey rest awhile on this couch and i will arrange this screen so as to protect your slumbers leads little elfie to couch elfie sleepily thanks dear grandma thanks now i shall go to sleep and dream of you and the dogs and angels i so often dream about angels but that is generally after supper and to-night i have had no supper but never mind good-night granny good-night good-night Goo, goo. she sinks softly into sleep lady beldame and i was about to set the bloodhounds upon this little sunbeam tis long since these grim walls have echoed strains so sweet as hers croons woo lucindy etc they tried him by a jury way down in old missouri and they hung him to a possum dip tree goes to couch and gazes on the little sleeper how peacefully she slumbers what a change has come over me in one short hour my withered heart is sending up green shoots of tenderness of love and hope let me try henceforth to be worthy of this dear child's affection and respect turns and sees monkshood ha ah, monkshood then there is time yet those parcels quick quick the parcels monkshood impassively have been left as you instructed my lady cord lady beldame staggers back gasping into a chair little elfie awakes behind screen and rubs her eyes lady beldame in a hoarse whisper you you have left the parcels all all tell me how were they received speak low i would not that yonder child should awake and hear little elfie behind the screen very wide awake indeed dear good old granny she would conceal her generosity even from me loudly she little thinks that i am overhearing all monkshood i could have sworn i heard whispering lady beldame nay you are mistaken twas but the wind and the old wainscot aside he is quite capable of destroying that innocent child but old and attached servant as he is there are liberties i still know how to forbid to monkshood your story quick monkshood first i delivered the cigars to sir v. v long whom i found under his veranda he seemed surprised and gratified by the gift selected a weed and was proceeding to light it whilst he showed a desire to converse familiarly with me hastily excusing myself i drove away when lady beldame when what do not torture a wretched old woman monkshood when i heard a loud report behind me and in the portion of a brace two waistcoat buttons and half a slipper which hurtled past my ears i recognized all that was mortal of the late sir vivi 
You mix them cigars uncommon strong, m'lady. Elfie, aside. Can it be? But no, no, I will not believe it. I am sure that dear Granny meant no harm. Lady Beldane, with a grim pride she cannot wholly repress. I have devoted some study to the subject of explosives. Tis another triumph to the anti-tobacconists. And what of Lady Violet Powdray? Did she apply the salve? Monkshood. Judging from the art-rending owls which proceeded from Carmine Cottage, the salve was producing the desired effect. Her ladyship, however, terminated her sufferings somewhat premature by jumping out of a top winder, just as I was taking my departure. Lady Beldame. She should have died hereafter, but no matter. And the upas tree? Monkshood. Was presented to the pergaments, who unpacked it and loaded its branches with toys and tapers, after which Mr. Pergament mrs pergament and all the little pergaments joined hands and danced round it in light-hearted glee in a sombre tone they little knew as how it was their dance of death lady Beldame, that knowledge will come and the beer monkshood you saw it broached monkshood upon the village grain the mortality is still spreading it being found impossible to undo the knots in which the victims have tied themselves the sweetmeats were likewise distributed, and the floor of the infant school now resembles one vast fly-paper. Lady Beldame, with a touch of remorse. The children, too. Was not my little Elfie once an infant? Ah, me! Ah, me! Elfie, aside. Once, but that was long ago. And, oh, how disappointed I am in poor dear Grandmama! Lady Beldame. Monk's Hood, you should not have done these things. You should have saved me from myself. You must have known how greatly all this would increase my unpopularity in the neighborhood. Monk's Hood, sulkily. And this is my reward for obeying orders? Take care, my lady. It suits you now to throw me aside like a... Casting about for an original simile. Like a old glove, because this innocent grandchild of yours has touched your flinty art but where will you be when she learns lady beldame in agony ah no monkshood good faithful monkshood she must never know that think monkshood you would not tell her that the grandmother to whom she looks up with such touching childlike love was a homicide you would not do that monkshood some would say even homicide was not too black a name for all you've done lady beldame shudders i might tell miss elfie how you blowed up a live baronet corrosive sublimated a gentle lady only for having in a moment of candour called you a hold cat and distributed pison in a variety of forms about this smiling village and if that don't inspire her with disgust i don't know the nature of children that's all i might tell her i say and if i'm to keep my mouth shut i shall expect it to be considered in my wages lady beldame i knew you had a good heart i will pay you anything anything provided you shield my guilt from her wait you shall have gold gold monkshood gold cord little elfie suddenly comes from behind the screen limelight on her the other two shrink back elfie do not give that bad old man money grandmother for it will only be wasted lady beldame speak child how much do you know elfie all cord lady beldame collapses on chair lady beldame with an effort and now elfie that you know you scorn and hate your poor old grandmother is it not so elfie it is wrong to hate one's grandmother whatever she does at first when i heard i was very very sorry i did think it was most unkind of you but now oh i can't believe that you had not some good wise motive in acting as you did lady beldame in conscience stricken aside even this cannot shatter her artless faith oh wretch wretch covers her face monkshood motive i believe you there missy why she went and insured all their lives aforehand she did lady beldame monkshood in pity hold your peace elfie her face beaming i knew it i was sure of it oh granny my dear kind old granny you insured their lives first so that no real harm could possibly happen to them oh i am so happy 
lady beldame aside what shall i say merciful powers what shall i say to her disturbed sounds without monkshood i don't know what you'd better say but i can tell you what your ladyship had better do and that is take your ook while you can even now the outraged populace approaches to wreak a hawful vengeance upon your guilty ed melodramatic music lady beldame distractedly a mob i cannot face them they will tear me limb from limb at my age i could not survive such an indignity as that hide me monkshood help me to escape monkshood there is a secret underground passage known only to myself communicating with the nearest railway station i will point it out and personally conduct your ladyship uh, for a consideration one thousand pounds down the noise increases elfie no granny don't trust him be calm and brave await the mob here leave it all to me i will explain everything to them how you met no ill how at the very time they thought you were meditating an injury you were actually spending money and insuring all their lives when i tell them that monk's hood oh you tell them that and see it's too late now they are here shouts without lady beldame crouches on floor little elfie goes to the window throws open the shutters and stands on balcony in her fluttering white robe and the limelight elfie yes they are here why they are carrying torches lady beldame groans and banners too i think they have a band who is that tall stout gentleman in the white hat on horseback and the lady in a pony trap with oh such a beautiful complexion there is an inscription on one of the flags i can read it quite plainly thanks to the generous donor that must be you grandmother and there are children who dance and scatter flowers they're asking for a speech speaking off if you please ladies and gentlemen my grandmamma is not at all well but she wishes me to say she wishes you a merry christmas and is very glad you all like your presents so much good-bye good-bye returning down stage now they have gone away granny they did look so grateful lady beldame bewildered what is this sir vivi lady violet alive well this deputation of gratitude am i mad dreaming or does it all mean monkshood doggedly it means that the sight of this ere angel child recalled me to a sense of what i might be exposing myself to by carrying out your ladyship's commands and so i took the liberty of substituting gifts more calculated to inspire gratitude in their recipients that's what it means lady beldame wretch then you have disobeyed me you leave this day month elfie pleading nay grandmother bear with him or has not his disobedience spared you from acts that you might some day have regretted there mr butler granny forgives you see she holds out her hand and here's mine and now lady beldame smiling tenderly now you shall sing us wo lucinda little elfie fetches her banjo and sings wo lucinda her grandmother and the aged steward join in the dance and chorus and embracing the child they form picture as curtain falls end of section twenty read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com twenty one of mr punch's model music hall by f anstey this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Section 21. Number 8. Jack Parker, or The Bull Who Knew His Business. Characters. Jack Parker was a cruel boy, for mischief was his sole employ. Vide. Miss Jane Taylor. Miss Lydia Banks, though very young, will never do what's rude or wrong. Ditto. Farmer Banks and Farmer Banks's Bull by the Brothers Griffiths. Chorus of Farm Hands. Scene A farmyard. Right, a stall from which the head of the bull is visible above the half door. Enter Farmer Banks with a cudgel. Farmer Banks moodily 
when roots are quiet and cereals are dull i vent my irritation on the bull we have miss taylor's own authority for this rhyme come hup you beast opens the stall and flourishes cudgel the bull comes forward with an air of deliberate defiance oh turnin narsty is he apologetically to bull another time will do i see you're busy the bull after some consideration decides to accept this retractation and retreats with dignity to his stall the door of which he carefully fastens after him exit farmer banks left as lydia banks enters right accompanied by chorus the bull exhibits the liveliest interest in her proceedings as he looks on with his forelegs folded easily upon the top of the door song lydia banks in polka time i'm the child by miss jane taylor's song and naturally good for one so young a pattern for the people that i go among with my moral little tags on the tip of my tongue and i often feel afraid that i shan't live long for i never do a thing that's rude or wrong chorus to which the bull beats time as a general rule one doesn't live long if you never do a thing that's rude or wrong second verse my words are all with wisdom fraught to make polite replies i've sought and learned by independent thought that a pinafore inked is good for naught so wonderfully well have i been taught that i turn my toes as children not chorus to which the bull dances this moral lesson she's been taught she turns her toes as children not lydia sweetly yes i'm the farmer's daughter lydia banks no person ever caught me playing pranks i'm loved by all the live stock on the farm ironical applause from the bull pigeons i've plucked will perch upon my arm and pigs at my approach sit up and beg business by bull for me the partial peacock saves his egg no sheep e'er snaps if i attempt to touch her lambs like it when i lead them to the butcher each morning i milk my rams beneath the shed while rabbits flutter twittering round my head and as befits a dairy farmer's daughter what milk i get i supplement with water a huge shadow is thrown on the road outside lydia starts whose shadow is it makes the highway darker that bullet head those ears it is jack parker cord the chorus flee in dismay as jack enters with a reckless swagger song jack parker i'm loafing about and i very much doubt if my excellent ma is aware that i'm out in my time i employ and attempts to annoy and am not what you'd call an agreeable boy i shoo the cats with walnut shells tin cans to curs i tie ring furious nails at front door bells then round the corner fly neath donkey's tails i fasten furs or timid horsemen scare if chance occurs i stalk with burrs my little sister's hair the bull shakes his head reprovingly such tricks give me joy without any alloy but they do not denote an agreeable boy as jack parker concludes the bull ducks cautiously below the half door while lydia conceals herself behind the pump l c jack wandering about stage discontentedly i thought at least there'd be some beasts to badger here call this a farm there ain't a blooming spadger here approaches stall bull raises head suddenly a bull this is a lark i've long awaited he's in a stable so he should be baited the bull shows symptoms of acute depression at this jeu de mots lydia comes forward indignantly lydia i can't stand by and see that poor bull suffer excitement sure to make his beef taste tougher the bull emphatically corroborates this statement be warned by miss jane taylor fractured skulls invariably come from teasing bulls so let that door alone nor lift the latch it for if the bull gets out why then you'll catch it jack a fractured skull ya don't believe a word of it raises latchet cord bull comes slowly out and crouches ominously jack retreats and takes refuge on top of pump 
the bull after scratching his back with his foreleg makes a sudden rush at lydia lydia as she evades it here help it's chasing me it's too absurd of it go away bull with me you have no quarrel the bull intimates that he is acting from a deep sense of duty lydia impatiently you stupid thing you're ruining the moral the bull persists obstinately in his pursuit jack from top of pump well dodged miss banks although the bull i'll back enter farmhands lydia come quick this bull's mistaking me for jack jack he knows his business best i shouldn't wonder farmhands philosophically he ain't the sort of bull to make a blunder they look on lydia panting such violent exercise will soon exhaust me the bull comes behind her oh bull it is unkind of you you've tossed me falls on ground while the bull stands over her in readiness to give the coup de grace lydia calls for help a farmhand encouragingly nay miss he seems more sensible nor surly he knows as how good children perish early the bull nods in acknowledgment that he is at last understood and slaps his chest with his forelegs lydia bull i'll turn naughty if you'll but be lenient goodness i see is sometimes inconvenient i promise you henceforth i'll try at any rate to act like children who are unregenerate the bull after turning this over decides to accept a compromise jack and lydia when you ready for a lark are just give a chai hike to your friend jack parker they shake hands warmly finale lydia i thought to slowly fade away so calm and beautiful though i didn't mean to go just yet but you get no chance for pathos when you're shivvied by a bull so i thought i wouldn't go just yet for i did feel so upset when i found that all you get by the exercise of virtue is that bulls will come and hurt you that i thought i wouldn't go just yet chorus we hear with some regret that she doesn't mean to go just yet but a bull with horns that hurt you is a poor return for virtue so she's wiser not to go just yet the bull rises on his hind legs and gives a forehoof each to lydia and jack who dance wildly round and round as the curtain falls n b music hall managers are warned that the morality of this particular drama may possibly be called in question by some members of the london county council End of section twenty one read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com two of mr punch's model music hall by f anstey this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by don w jenkins section twenty two number nine under the harrow a conventional comedy melodrama in two acts characters sir poshbury puddock a haughty and high-minded baronet verbena puddock his daughter lord bless you her lover spiker a needy and unscrupulous adventurer blethers an ancient and attached domestic act one scene the morning-room at natterjack hall toadley lee hole large window open at back with heavy practicable sash enter blethers blethers sir Pospery's birthday to-day his birthday and the gentry giving of him presents oh lor if they only knew what i could tell em ah and must tell too before long but not yet not yet exit enter lord bless you and verbena verbena yes papa is forty to-day innocently fancy living to that age the tenants have presented him with a handsome jar of mixed pickles with an appropriate inscription papa is loved and respected by every one and i well i have made him a little housewife containing needles and thread see shows it 
Lord bless you. Tenderly. I say, I wish you would make me a little housewife. Comedy love dialogue omitted owing to want of space. Verbena. Oh, do look. There's Papa crossing the lawn with, oh, such a horrid man following him. Lord bless you. Regular bounder. Shocking bad hat. Verbena. Not so bad as his boots, and they are not so bad as his face. Why doesn't Papa order him to go away? Oh, he is actually inviting him in. Enter Sir Poshbury, gloomy and constrained, with Spiker, who is jaunty and somewhat over-familiar. Spiker, sitting on the piano and dusting his boots with his handkerchief. Cozy little shanty you've got here, Puddock. Very tasty. Sir Puddock, with gulp. I am ha, delighted that you approve of it. Ah, Verbena. Kisses her on forehead. Spiker. Your daughter, eh? Pooty gal. Introduce me. Sir Poshbury introduces him with an effort. Verbena, coldly. How do you do? Papa, did you know that the sash line of this window was broken? If it is not mended, it will fall on somebody's head and perhaps kill him sir poshbury absently yes yes it shall be attended to but leave us my child go bless you this er gentleman and i have business of importance to discuss spiker don't let us drive you away miss your pa and me are only talking over old times that's all eh posh sir poshbury in a tortured aside have a care sir don't drive me too far to verbena leave us i say lord bless you and verbena go out raising their eyebrows now sir what is this secret you profess to have discovered spiker oh a mere nothing takes out a cigar got a light about you thanks perhaps you don't recollect twenty-seven years ago this very day travelling from edgware road to baker street by the underground railway sir poshbury perfectly it was my thirteenth birthday and i celebrated the event by a visit to madame tussaud's spiker exactly it was your thirteenth birthday and you travelled second class with a half ticket meaningly on your thirteenth birthday sir poshbury terribly agitated fiend that you are how came you to learn this spiker very simple i was at that time in the temporary position of ticket collector at baker street in the exuberance of boyhood you cheeked me oh, i swore to be even with you some day sir poshbury even if if your accusation were well founded how are you going to prove it spiker oh that's easy i preserved the half ticket on the chance that i should require it as evidence hereafter sir poshbury aside and so the one error of an otherwise blameless boyhood has found me out at last to spiker i fear you not my crime if crime indeed it is is surely condoned by twenty-seven long years of unimpeachable integrity spiker by-laws are by-laws old buck there's no statute of limitations in criminal offences that ever i heard of nothing can alter the fact that you being turned thirteen obtained a half ticket by a false representation that you were under age a line from me even now denouncing you to the traffic superintendent and i'm very much afraid sir poshbury writhing spiker my my dear friend you won't do that you won't expose me think of my age my position my daughter spiker Ah, oh, now you've touched the right chord. I was thinking of your daughter, a nice lady-like gal. I don't mind telling you she fetched me, sir, at the first glance. Give me her hand and I burn the compromising half-ticket before your eyes on our return from church after the wedding. Come, that's a fair offer. Sir Poshbury, indignantly. My child, the ripening apple of my failing eye, to be sacrificed to a blackmailing blackguard like you? Never while I live. Spiker. Just as you please, and if you will kindly oblige me with writing materials, I will just drop a line to the traffic superintendent. Sir Poshbury, hoarsely. No, no, not that. Wait, listen, I, I will speak to my daughter. 
i promise nothing but if her heart is still her own to give she may mind you i do not say she will be induced to link her lot to yours though i shall not attempt to influence her in any way in any way spiker well you know your own business best old cockalorum here comes the young lady so i'll leave you to manage this delicate fare alone ta ta i shan't be far off swaggers insolently out as verbena enters sir poshbury my child i have just received an offer for your hand i know not if you will consent verbena i can guess who has made that offer and why i consent with all my heart dear papa sir poshbury can i trust my ears you consent noble girl he embraces her verbena i was quite sure dear bless you meant to speak and i do love him very much sir poshbury starting it is not lord bless you my child but mr samuel spiker the gentleman for he is at heart a gentleman whom i introduced to you just now verbena i have seen so little of him papa i cannot love him you must really excuse me sir poshbury ah oh, but you will my darling you will i know your unselfish nature you will to save your poor old dad from a terrible disgrace yes disgrace listen twenty-seven years ago he tells her all verbena at this very moment there is a subscription on foot in the county to present me with my photograph done by an itinerant photographer of the highest eminence and framed and glazed ready for hanging is that photograph never to know the nail which even now awaits it can you not surrender a passing girlish fancy to spare your fond old father's name mr spiker is peculiar perhaps in many ways not quite of our monde but he loves you sincerely my child and that is in itself a recommendation oh i see my prayers are vain be happy then as for me let the police come i am ready weeps verbena not so papa i will marry this mr spiker since it is your wish sir poshbury dries his eyes sir poshbury here spiker my dear fellow it is all right come in she accepts you enter spiker spiker thought she would sensible little gal well miss you shan't regret it bless you we'll be as chummy together as a couple of little dicky birds verbena mr spiker let us understand one another i will do my best to be a good wife to you but chumminess is not mine to give nor can i promise ever to be your dicky bird enter lord bless you lord bless you sir poshbury may i have five minutes with you verbena you need not go looking at spiker perhaps this person will kindly relieve us of his presence spiker sorry to disoblige old fellow but i'm on duty where miss verbena is now you see as she's just promised to be my wife lord bless you your wife verbena faintly yes lord bless you is wife sir poshbury yes my poor boy his wife verbena totters and falls heavily in a dead faint right centre upsetting a flower stand lord bless you staggers and swoons on sofa centre overturning a table of knick-knacks sir poshbury sinks into a chair left centre and covers his face with his hands spiker looking down on them triumphantly under the harrow by gad under the harrow curtain and end of act one act two scene same as in act one that is the morning room at natterjack hall evening of same day enter blethers blethers another sir poshbury's birthday is almost gone and my secret still untold daughters i can't keep it up much longer ha here comes his lordship he does look mortal bad that he do miss verbena ain't treated him too well from all i can hear poor young feller enter lord bless you lord bless you blethers by the memory of the innumerable half-crowns that have passed between us be my friend now i have no others left persuade your young mistress to come hither you need not tell her i am here you understand be discreet and this florin shall be yours blethers leave it to me my lord i'd tell a lie for less than that any day old as i am exit 
Lord bless you. I cannot rest until I have heard from her own lips that the past few hours have been nothing but a horrible dream. She is coming. Now for the truth. Enter Verbena. Verbena. Papa, did you want me? Recognizes Lord bless you. Controls herself to a cold formality. My lord, to what do I owe this, this unexpected intrusion? Pants violently. Lord bless you. Verbena, tell me, you cannot really prefer that seedy snob in the burst boots to me. Verbena, aside. How can I tell him the truth without betraying dear papa? No, I must lie, though it kills me. To Lord bless you. Lord bless you, I have been trifling with you. I, I never loved you. Lord bless you. I see, and all the while your heart was given to a howling cad. Verbena and if it was who can account for the vagaries of a girlish fancy we women are capricious beings you know with hysterical gaiety but you are unjust to mr spiker he has not yet howled in my presence aside though i verily nearly did in his lord bless you and you really love him verbena i i love him aside my heart will break lord bless you then i have no more to say farewell verbena be as happy as the knowledge that you have wrecked one of the brightest careers and soured one of the sweetest natures in the county will permit goes up stage and returns a few days since you presented me with a cloth pen wiper in the shape of a dog of unknown breed if you will kindly wait here for half an hour i shall have much pleasure in returning a memento which i have no longer the right to retain and there are several little things i give you which i can take back with me at the same time if you will have them put up in readiness exit verbena oh he is cruel cruel but i shall keep the little boneyard measure and the diamond pig they are all i have to remind me of him enter spiker slightly intoxicated spiker throwing himself on sofa without seeing verbena i don't know how it is but i feel precious sleepy somehow perhaps i did partake little too freely of sir poshbury's generous burgundy wonder why they call it generous it didn't give me anything except a bloomin headache however i punished it and old poshbury had to look on and let me <laughs> examining his hand who'd think to look at this thumb that there was a real live baronet squirming under it but there is snores verbena bitterly and that thing is my affianced husband ah uh, no i cannot go through with it he is too repulsive if i could but find a way to free myself without compromising poor papa the sofa cushion dare i it would be quite painless surely the removal of such an odious wretch cannot be murder i will slow music she gets a cushion and presses it tightly over spiker's head oh i wish he wouldn't gurgle like that now he does kick he cannot even die like a gentleman spiker's kicks become more and more feeble and eventually cease how still he lies i almost wish mr spiker mr spiker no answer oh i really have suffocated him enter sir poshbury you papa sir poshbury what verbena sitting with the uh, him samuel in the gloaming sings with forced hilarity in the gloaming oh my darling that's as it should be quite as it should be verbena in dull strained accents don't sing papa i cannot bear it just yet i have just suffocated mr spiker with a sofa cushion see shows the body sir poshbury then i am safe he will tell no tales now but my child are you aware of the very serious nature of your act an act of which as a justice of the peace i am bound to take some official cognizance verbena do not scold me papa was it not done for your sake sir poshbury i cannot accept such an excuse as that i fear your motives were less disinterested than you would have me believe and now verbena what will you do as your father i would gladly screen you but as a magistrate i cannot promise to be more than passive verbena 
listen papa i have thought of a plan why should i not wheel this sofa to the head of the front doorsteps and tip it over they will only think he fell down when intoxicated for he had taken far too much wine papa sir poshbury always the same quick-witted little fairy go my child but be careful that none of the servants see you verbena wheels the sofa and spiker's body out left upstage exit my poor impulsive darling i do hope she will not be seen servants do make some mischief but there's an end of spiker at any rate i should not have liked him for a son-in-law and with him goes the only person who knows my unhappy secret enter blethers blethers sir poshbury i have a secret to reveal which i can preserve no longer it concerns something that happened many years ago it is connected with your birthday sir poshbury sir poshbury quailing what another i must stop his tongue at all hazards ah the rotten sash line to blethers i will hear you but first close yonder window the night air is growing chill blethers goes to window at back slow music as he approaches it lord Lesshew enters right second entrance and with a smothered cry of horror drags him back by the coat-tails just before the window falls with a tremendous crash sir poshue bless you what have you done lord bless you sternly saved him from an untimely end and you from crime collapse of sir poshbury enter verbena terrified verbena papa papa hide me the night air and the cold stone steps have restored mr spiker to life and consciousness he is coming to denounce me you both of us he is awfully annoyed sir poshbury recklessly it is useless to appeal to me child i have enough to do to look after myself now enter spiker indignant spiker pretty treatment for a gentleman this look here poshbury this young lady has choked me with a cushion and then pitched me down the front steps i might have broken my neck sir poshbury it was an oversight which i lament but for which i must decline to be answerable you must settle your differences with her spiker and you too old horse you had a hand in this i know and i'll pay you out for it now my life ain't safe if i marry a girl like that so i've made up my mind to split and be done with it sir poshbury contemptuously if you don't blethers will so do your worst you hound spiker very well then i will to the rest i denounce this man for travelling with a half ticket from edgware road to baker street on his thirteenth birthday the thirty-first of march twenty-seven years ago this very day sensation blethers hear me it was not his thirteenth birthday sir poshbury's birthday falls on the first of april to-morrow i was sent to register the birth and by a blunder which i have repented bitterly ever since unfortunately gave the wrong date till this moment i have never had the manliness or sincerity to confess my error for fear of losing my situation sir poshbury to spiker do you hear you paltry knave i was not thirteen consequently i was under age and the by-laws are still unbroken your hold over me is gone gone for ever spiker hm spiker spike this time retires up disconcerted lord bless you and you did not really love him after all verbena verbena with arch pride have i not proved my indifference lord bless you but i forget you admitted that you were but trifling with my affection take back your pincushion verbena keep it all that i did was done to spare my father sir poshbury who as a matter of fact was innocent but i forgive you child for your unworthy suspicions bless you my boy you have saved me from unnecessarily depriving myself of the services of an old retainer blethers i condone a dissimulation for which you have done much to atone spiker you vile and miserable rascal be off and be thankful that i have sufficient magnanimity to refrain from giving you in charge spiker sneaks off crushed and now my children and my faithful old servant congratulate me that i am no longer verbena and lord bless you together under the harrow affecting family tableau and quick curtain 
End of section 22. Read by Don W. Jenkins, Rancho San Diego, California, shaggybark.blogspot.com. of Mr. Punch's Model Music Hall by F. Anstey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Section 23. Tommy and His Sister Jane. Characters. Tommy and His Sister Jane. Taylorian Twins and Awful Examples. Their Wicked Uncle. Plagiarized from a forgotten nursery story and slightly altered old farmer coupier skilled in the use of horse and cattle medicines scene a shady lane on the right a gate leading to the farm left some bushes covered with practicable scarlet berries enter the wicked uncle stealthily the wicked uncle no peace of mind i ever shall know again till i have cooked the grease of tom and jane but though a naughty i'm a nervous nunky for downright felonies i'm far too funky i'd hire assassins but of late the villains have raised their usual fee to fifteen shillings nor to reduce their rates will i engage sympathetically for two poor orphans who are under age so as i give no more than half a guinea i must myself get rid of tom and jenny yet like an old soft-hearted fool i falter and can't make up my mind to risk a halter looking off ha in the distance jane and little tom i see those berries meditatively why it only needs diplomacy ho ho a most ingenious experiment indulges in silent sinister mirth as jane and tom trip in and regard him with innocent wonder jane uncle what is the joke why all this merriment the wicked uncle in guilty confusion not merriment my loves a trifling spasm don't be alarmed your uncle often has em i'm feeling better than i did at first you're looking flushed though not i hope with thirst insidiously song by the wicked uncle the sun is scorching overhead the roads are dry and dusty and here are berries ripe and red refreshing when you're thirsty they're hanging just within your reach inviting you to clutch em but as your uncle i beseech you won't attempt to touch em tommy and jane dutifully we'll do whatever you beseech and not attempt to touch them annoyance of wicked uncle the wicked uncle temptation so i've understood a child in order kept shuns and fruit in lanes is seldom good with several exceptions however freely you partake it can't as you are young kill but should it cause a stomach ache well don't you blame your uncle tommy and jane no should it cause a stomach ache we will not blame our uncle the wicked uncle aside they'll need no further personal assistance but take the bait when i am at a distance i could not were i paid a thousand ducats with sentiment stand by and see them kick their little buckets or look on while their sticks this pretty pair cut stealing off tommy what uncle going the wicked uncle with assumed jauntiness just to get my hair cut goes tommy looking wistfully at the berries i say they do look nice jane such a lot too jane demurely well tommy uncle never told us not to slow music they gradually approach the berries which they pick and eat with increasing relish culminating in a dance of delight duet tommy and jane with step dance tommy dancing with his mouth full these berries ain't so bad although they far too much acidity jane ditto to me their only drawback is a dash of insipidity tommy rudely 
fat all the same your wolf and numb with wonderful avidity jane indignantly no that i'm not so there now tommy calmly but you are jane and so are you they retire up dancing and eating more berries after which they gaze thoughtfully at each other jane this fruit is most refreshing but it's curious how it cloys on you tommy with anxiety i wonder why all appetite for dinner it destroys in you jane oh tommy aren't you half afraid you've ate enough to poison you tommy no that i'm not so there now etc etc they dance as before tommy jane is your palate parching up in a horrible aridity jane it is and in my throat's a lump of singular solidity tommy then that is why you're dancing with such poker light rigidity refrain as before they dance with decreasing spirit and finally stop and fan one another with their hats tommy jane is your palate parching up in horrible aridity jane it is and in my throat's a lump of singular solidity tommy then that is why you're dancing with such poker like rigidity refrain as before they dance with decreasing spirit and finally stop and fan one another with their hats jane i'm better now that on my brow there is a little breeziness tommy my passing qualm is growing calm and tightness turns to easiness jane you seem to me tormented by a tendency to queasiness refrain they attempt to continue the dance but suddenly sit down side by side jane with a gasp i don't know what it is but oh i do feel so peculiar tommy with a gulp i've tumults taking place within that i may say unruly are jane why tommy you are turning green you really and you truly are tommy no that i am not so there now jane but you are tommy and so are you melancholy music to which tommy and jane after a few convulsive movements gradually become inanimate enter old farmer coupier from gate carrying a large bottle labelled cattle medicine farmer coupier it's time i gave the old bay mare her drench stumbles over the children what's there a lifeless lad and a little wench been eating berries where did they get them ideas for cows when took so i've the regular remedies i'll try em here and if their state the worse is why they shall have them balls i give my erses carries the bodies off just before the wicked uncle re-enters wicked uncle the children gone yon bush of berries less full hooray my little stratagem successful dances a triumphant passu re-enter farmer coupier farmer coupier been looking for your little niece and nephew the wicked uncle yes searching for them everywhere farmer coupier ironically oh have you then let me tell you from all pain they're free sir the wicked uncle falling on his knees i didn't poison them it wasn't me sir farmer coupier i thought as much a constable i'll run for exit the wicked uncle my wretched nerves again this time i'm done for well though i'm trapped and useless all the skies is my case shall ne'er come on at the assizes rushes desperately to tree and crams himself with the remaining berries which produce an almost instantaneous effect re-enter tom and jane from gate looking pale and limp terror of the wicked uncle as he turns and recognizes them the wicked uncle with tremulous politeness the shades of jane and tommy i presume re-enter farmer coupier jane and tommy pointing to farmer coupier his cattle mixture snatched us from the tomb the wicked uncle with a flicker of hope why then the self-same drugs will ease my torments farmer coupier chuckling too late they've drunk the lot the little varmints the wicked uncle bitterly so out of life i must in glorious wriggle pursued by tommy's grin and jenny's giggle 
dies in great agony while tommy jane and farmer coupier look on with mixed emotions as the curtain falls end of section twenty three read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com four of mr punch's model music hall by f anstey this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by don w jenkins section twenty four number eleven the rival dolls miss jenny and polly each had a new dolly vide poem characters miss jenny miss polly by the sisters limar the soldier doll the sailor doll by the two armstrongs scene a nursery enter miss jenny and miss polly who perform a blameless step dance with an improving chorus oh isn't it jolly we've each a new dolly and one is a soldier the other's a tar we're fully contented with what's been presented such good little children we both of us are they dance up to a cupboard from which they bring out two large dolls which they place on chairs miss jenny don't they look nice come polly let us strive to make ourselves believe that they're alive miss polly addressing sailor doll i'm glad you're mine i dote on all that's nautical the sailor doll opening his eyes suddenly excuse me miss your sister's more my sort of gal kisses his hand to miss jenny who shrinks back shocked and alarmed miss jenny oh polly did you hear i feel so shy the sailor doll with mild self-assertion i can say pa and ma and wink my eye does so at miss polly who runs in terror to miss jenny's side miss jenny why both are showing signs of animation miss polly who think we had such strong imagination the soldier doll aside to the sailor doll i say old fellow we have caught their fancy and each of us they now a real man see let's keep it up the sailor doll dubiously do you think as we can do it the soldier doll you'll stick by me and i will see you through it sit up and turn your toes out don't you loll put on the man and drop the bloomin doll the sailor doll pulls himself together and rises from chair importantly the sailor doll in the manner of a music hall chairman ladies with your kind leave this gallant gent will now his military sketch present miss jenny and polly applaud the soldier doll after feebly expostulating is induced to sing song by the soldier doll when i used to be displayed in the burlington arcade with artillery arrayed underneath shoulder hump i imagined that i made all the lady dolls afraid i should draw my battle blade from its sheath shoulder hump for i'm mars's gallant son and my back i've shown to none nor was ever seen to run from the strife shoulder hump on the battles i'd have won and the dashing deeds have done if i'd ever fired a gun in my life shoulder hump refrain to be sung marching round stage by your right flank wheel let the front rank kneel with the bristle of the steel to the foe till the regiments reel at our rattling peal and the military zeal we show repeat with the whole company marching round after him the soldier doll my friend will next oblige this jolly jack tar will give his song and chorus in carrick tar same business with sailor doll song by the sailor doll in costume i'm so maritime you'd never suppose the fact is that with the fleet in regent street i'd precious little naval practice 
there was saucy craft rigged fore and aft inside o oh, mr creamers from noah's arks to clipper built barks likewise mechanical steamers chorus but to navigate the serpentine ye ho my lads ahoy with clockwork sails or spirits of wine ye ho my lads ahoy i did respectfully decline so i was left in port to pine which wasn't as actually the line of a rollicking sailor boy ye ho of a rollicking sailor boy yes there was lots of boats and yachts of timber and of tin too but one and all was far too small for a dollar my size to get into i was too big on any brig to ship without disaster and it wouldn't never do when the captain and the crew were a set of little swabs all plaster chorus so to navigate the serpentine ye ho my lads ahoy with clockwork sails or spirits of wine ye ho my lads ahoy i did respectfully decline so i was left in port to pine which wasn't as actually the line of a rollicking sailor boy you ho of a rollicking sailor boy an ark is perhaps the birth for chaps as is fond o natural history but i says to shem and the rest o them how you get along at all's a mystery with a wild beast show let loose below and four females on deck too i never could agree with your happy family and your lubberly ways i object to chorus hornpipe by the company after which the soldier doll advances condescendingly to miss jenny the soldier doll invincible i'm reckoned by the ladies but yield to you though conquering my trade is miss jenny repulsing him oh go away you great conceited thing you the soldier doll persists in offering her attentions miss polly watching them bitterly to be deserted by one's doll does sting you the sailor doll approaches the sailor doll to miss polly let me console you miss a sailor doll as swears his art was ever true to paul n b good opportunity for song here miss polly indignantly to miss jenny your sailor's teasing me to be his idol do make him stop spitefully when you've quite done with my doll miss jenny scornfully if you suppose i want your wretched warrior i'm sorry for you miss polly i for you am sorrier miss jenny weeping right polly preferred to me what ignominy miss polly weeping left my horrid soldier jilting me for jenny the two dolls face one another center sailor doll to soldier doll you've made her sluice her skylights now you swab soldier doll to sailor doll as you have broke her heart i'll break your knob hits him sailor doll in a pale fury this insult must be blotted out in bran soldier doll fiercely come on i'll shed your sawdust if i can miss jenny and polly throw themselves between the combatants miss jenny for any mess you make we shall be scolded so wait until a drugget we've unfolded they lay down drugget on stage the soldier doll politely no hurry miss we don't object to waiting the sailor doll aside his valor like my own's evaporating defiantly to soldier doll on guard you'll see how soon i'll run you through confidentially if you will not prod me i won't pink you the soldier doll through your faults kid my deadly blade i'll pass confidentially look here old fellow don't you be a hass they exchange passes at a considerable distance the sailor doll aside don't lose your temper now soldier doll don't get excited do keep a little farther off sailor doll delighted 
wounds soldier doll by misadventure soldier doll annoyed there now you've gone and made upon my wax a dent sailor doll excuse me it was really quite an accident soldier doll savagely such clumsiness would irritate a saint stabs sailor doll miss jenny and polly imploringly oh stop the sight of sawdust turns us faint they drop into chairs swooning sailor doll i'll pay you for that stabs soldier doll soldier doll right through you poked me sailor doll so you have me soldier doll you shouldn't have provoked me they fall transfixed sailor doll faintly alas we have been led away by vanity dolls shouldn't try to imitate humanity dies soldier doll for if they do they'll end like us unpitied each on the other's sword absurdly spitted dies miss jenny and polly revive and bend sadly over the corpses miss jenny from their untimely end we draw this moral how wrong it is even for dolls to quarrel miss polly yes jenny in the fate of these poor fellows see what sad results may spring from female jealousy they embrace penitently as curtain falls end of section twenty four read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com five of mr punch's model music hall by f anstey this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by don w jenkins section twenty five number twelve conrad or the thumbsucker adapted freely from a well-known poem in struwelpeter characters conrad age six conrad's mother forty seven the scissor man age immaterial scene an apartment in the house of conrad's mother window in centre at back opening upon a quiet thoroughfare it is dusk and the room is lighted only by the reflected gleam from the street lamps conrad discovered half hidden by left window curtain conrad watching street still there for full an hour he has not budged beyond the circle of yon lamp posts rays the gaslight falls upon his crimson hose and makes a steely glitter at his thigh while from the shadow peers a hatchet face and fixes sinister malignant eyes on whom shuddering i dare not trust myself to guess and yet ah no it cannot be myself i am so young one is still young at six what man can say that i have injured him since in my mother's absence all the day engaged upon municipal affairs i peacefully beguile the weary hours by suction of consolatory thumbs here he inserts his thumb in his mouth but almost instantly removes it with a start again i meet those eyes i'll look no more but draw the blind and shut my terror out draws blind and lights candle stage lightens hi ho i wish my mother were at home listening at last i hear her latchkey in the door enter conrad's mother a lady of strong-minded appearance rationally attired she carries a large reticule full of documents conrad's mother would conrad that you were of riper years so you might share your mother's joy to-day the day that crowns her long and arduous toil as one of london's county councillors conrad nay speak for though my mind be immature one topic still can charm my infant ear that ever craves the oft-repeated tale i love to hear of that august assembly his mother lifts her bonnet solemnly in which my mother's honoured voice is raised conrad's mother gratified learn conrad then that after many months of patient lobbying you've heard the term the measure by my foresight introduced has triumphed by a bare majority conrad my bosom thrills with dutiful delight although i yet for information wait as to the scope and purpose of the statute conrad's mother you show an interest so intelligent that well deserves it should be satisfied 
be seated conrad at your mother's knee and you shall hear the full particulars you know how zealously i advocate the sacred cause of nursery reform how through my efforts every infant's toys are carefully inspected once a month conrad wearily nay mother you forget i have no toys conrad's mother which brings you under the exemption clause but to resume how nursery songs and tales must now be duly licensed by our censor and any deviation from the text forbidden under heavy penalties all that you know well with concern of late i have remarked among our infancy the rapid increase of a baneful habit on which i scarce can bring my tongue to dwell the stage darker blind at back illuminated oh conrad there are children think of it so lost to every sense of decency that in mere wantonness or brainless sloth they obstinately suck forbidden thumbs conrad starts with irrepressible emotion forgive me if i shock your innocence sadly such things exist but soon shall cease to be thanks to the measure we have passed to-day conrad with growing uneasiness but how can statutes check such practices conrad's mother patting his head rights rudely questioned boy i come to that some timid sentimentalists advise compulsory restraint in woolen gloves or the deterrent aid of bitter aloes i saw the evil had too deep a seat to yield to such half-hearted remedies no we must cut ere we could hope to cure nay interrupt me not my bill appoints a new official by the style and title of london county council scissorman for the detection of young suck -a -thumbs here the shadow of a huge hand brandishing a gigantic pair of shears appears upon the blind conrad hiding his face in his mother's lap ah oh, mother see the scissors on the blind conrad's mother why how you tremble you've no cause to fear the shadow of his grim insignia should have no terror save for thumbsuckers conrad and what for them conrad's mother complacently a doom devised by me the confiscation of the culprit thumbs thus shall our statute cure while it corrects for those who have no thumbs can err no more the shadow slowly passes on the blind conrad appearing relieved at its departure loud knocking without both start to their feet conrad's mother who knocks so loud at such an hour as this a voice open i charge ye in the council's name conrad's mother tis the official red-legged scissor-man who doubtless calls to thank me for the post conrad with a gloomy determination more like his business madam is with me conrad's mother suddenly enlightened a suck -a -thumb? you conrad conrad desperately i from birth profound silence as mother and son face one another the knocking is renewed conrad's mother oh this is horrible it must not be i'll shoot the bolt and barricade the door conrad places himself before it and addresses his mother in a tone of incisive irony conrad why where is all the zeal you showed of late is thus that you the roman matron play trick not a statute of your own devising come your officials waiting let him in conrad's mother shrinks back appalled so you refuse throwing open door then enter scissorman enter the scissorman masked and in red tights with his hand upon the hilt of his shears the scissorman in passionless tone though sorry to create unpleasantness i claim the thumbs of this young gentleman which these own eyes have marked between his lips conrad's mother frantically thou minion of a meddling tyranny go exercise thy loathsome trade elsewhere the scissor man civilly i've duties here that must be first performed conrad's mother wildly take my two thumbs for his the scissor man tis not the law which is a model of lucidity conrad calmly sir you speak well my thumbs are forfeited and they alone must pay the penalty the scissor man with approval right step with me into the outer hall and have the business done without delay 
conrad's mother throwing herself between them stay i'm a counsellor this law was mine hereby i do suspend the clause i drew the scissorman you should have drawn it milder conrad must i teach apparent laws were meant to be obeyed to scissorman lead on sir to his mother with cold courtesy madam may i trouble you he thrusts her gently aside and passes out with the scissorman the door is shut and fastened from without conrad's mother rushes to door which she attempts to force without success conrad's mother in vain i batter at a senseless door i'll to the keyhole train my tortured ear listening dead silence is it over or to come hark was not that the click of meeting shears again and followed by the sullen thud of thumbs that drop upon linoleum the door is opened and conrad appears pale but erect n b the whole of this scene has been compared to one in la tosca which however it exceeds in horror and intensity conrad's mother they send him back to me bereft of both my conrad what repulse a mother's arms conrad with chilling composure yes madam for between us evermore a barrier invisible is raised and should i strive to reach those arms again two spectral thumbs would press me coldly back the thumbs i sucked in blissful ignorance the thumbs that solaced me in solitude the thumbs your county council took from me and your endearments scarcely will replace where madam lay the sin in sucking them the dog will lick his foot the cat her claw his paws sustain the hibernating bear and you decree no law to punish them yet in your rage for infantine reform you rush this most ridiculous enactment its earliest victim your neglected son conrad's mother falling at his feet say conrad you will some day pardon me conrad bitterly as he regards his maimed hands ay on the day these pollards send forth shoots his mother turns aside with heart-broken wail conrad standing apart in gloomy estrangement as the curtain descends end of section twenty five end of mr punch's model music hall by f anstey read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com